and Chapter 201 sidewalks to be held on April 21st, 2020 in the Little Bit Meeting Room, 208 Sanford Road, or Zoom meeting, which this is a Zoom meeting. John, over to you. John Carter, you gone? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this uh, public hearing is uh, from uh, the work that the Parking and Traffic Committee uh, has done over the last seven, eight months. Uh, we have had some uh, informational hearings uh, on this uh, ordinance and on the work that they've done, the plans on, on parking lots and designs for safety enhancements. Uh, in the air in the coastal beach areas. Um, what we're doing tonight is a public hearing on the ordinance amendments for chapter 201 sidewalks and 212 traffic and vehicles. Um, thanks in part to uh, the good work that the committee has done and the committee was 11 strong uh, made up of many of the people that are on the zoom um, uh, session this evening. People like Commissioner Clark, who uh, is in the right hand corner there doing something. <laughs> um, and um, basically, uh, Sally Stewart uh, of our uh, police department, uh, uh, vehicle enforcement division, our police captain, Captain Condon, and uh, many others. Uh, um, I don't know if. Uh, um, Betsy DeCapio is on, but she was uh, our leader on that. Uh, Carl Exted was also on the committee. But in long and short of it, um, the uh, work that the committee did uh, was to really clean up the two ordinances with new definitions and bring it into um, uh, current uh, modern times with different traffic and uh, vehicle uh, definitions. So um, on, and if the public would like to continue to review this, if you go to our website, to the Board of Selectmen's page, on the right-hand column are the public hearings. And in that uh, drop-down, you can uh, follow along with the ordinance amendments. So um, in chapter 201, uh, section 46, sidewalk use, um, the committee um, put in a better definition of what uh, should not be allowed on sidewalk uh, in the form of roller skating roller skiing, skateboarding, rollerblading, inline skating, or the use of bicycles, hoverboards, razors, scooters, and toy vehicles, whether propelled by muscle or motor on any sidewalk other than pedestrian way, except for handicapped carts, wheelchairs, or handicapped scooters propelled manually or by electric motor, including electric personal assistive mobility device. So um, it goes on to talk about is unlawful for any person to use sidewalk or other pedestrian way for the use of selling any goods or personal property or to place lawn chairs, beach chairs, blankets, and any other item whereby free passage to any said sidewalk or other pedestrian way is hindered or prevented or where prohibited by other town ordinances. That's chapter 201, uh, section 46. That's the only section in that ordinance that was changed. If we move on to uh, chapter 212, unless there's questions there, um, do you want to take, you want to take both ordinances at the same time, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, chapter 212, vehicles and traffic, uh, here again, <clears throat> Captain Condon uh, did the brunt of the work, and um, he may want to take us through it. Where is he? Jerry? Uh, 
don't see him. Yeah, I'm not seeing him on. I'm gonna have to go help him. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Well, moving uh, quickly through here, um, we again um, through Jerry, Jerry, and the, uh, and the police department's help updated all of the definitions, um, pretty much all of the definitions and authorities um, in in our uh, parking and traffic ordinance, which hadn't been done for years. And um, so right now under statutory authority, it has been amended by saying the Board of Selectmen in accordance to 30A MRSA uh, section 309 hereby enacts the following chapter regulating the operations of vehicles. The change is used for convenience of persons or property on a way, including taxi cabs and the designation of local for taxi cabs and it's added lunch wagons ice cream trucks and other conveniences motorized or powered otherwise within the town of wells and then we go into definitions and there is a definition upgrade to bicycles and i won't go through all of that it's uh the other uh new um definition is electric personal assisted mobility device uh, it is um, uh, things like segways um, that is defined. We then move down into the definition of motor vehicle. And um, that um, is cleaned up and um, ATVs were, take, were part of that definition and that's been taken out. Um, and we've, uh, it does not include snowmobiles, motorized wheelchairs or electric personal assisted mobility devices. So um, a lot of this, as I said earlier, um, is uh, definitions. Uh, we, we have a new definition of an off-road vehicle, all-terrain vehicle or ATV. We have a new uh, definition for motorized wheelchair, motorized scooter. We have um, a definition for recreational vehicle, uh, abbreviated as RV. Um, and um, again, um, we keep going through the uh, definitions until we get to um, section E under um, reasonable conditions allowed. E is it shall be unlawful for any time for any person or persons to engage in a roller skating. And then we add roller skiing, skateboarding, adding rollerblading, inline skating, the use of hoverboards, razor scooters, and toy vehicles, whether propelled by muscle or motor. Uh, um, or free frisbee or ball throwing on any street or bridge. And then we add, which includes on sidewalks, pedestrian walk areas, ramps, street rights away, gravel lanes and shoulders um, and pedestrian seating and entrance areas to the beach within the town of Wells Beach Casino parking lot. And in parentheses, we add motorized wheelchairs and motorized scooters as defined in section 212-3 definitions of this chapter are exempt. Um, we then, is he still missing in action here? You're doing a fine job, Jim. <laughs> we, we then add um, a number 10 uh, it says no vehicle shall be parked or left standing attended or unattended with the exception of those described in 212.15 A, B, and C parking exemptions in such a manner that causes any part uh, or overhang of the vehicle or its contents to protrude into any part of the travel lane, a pedestrian walkway, or edge of pavement that may necessitate any vehicle, bicycle, or pedestrian to move further out into the travel lane, cross over into the oncoming 
plane or otherwise to avoid such uh, protrusion. Uh, that, what that is is uh, on streets like Atlantic Avenue where everything's very tight to the road, um, there is uh, a real hazard that the uh, parking and traffic committee um, saw where, and it was pointed out, that cars were left hanging into uh, the street and pedestrians and, uh, vehicle, and uh, bicyclists uh, had to move around the vehicle and step into oncoming traffic. So that is uh, there to try to help uh, alleviate that. And then number 11, no vehicles shall be parked, stopped, or left standing, attended, or unattended on any public way for the purpose of unloading or loading beachgoers any or any of their beach accessories. What the parking committee heard loud and clear was that one of the biggest problems we have with so many rights of ways to the beach uh, was the stopping and unloading of, vehicle, of uh, beachgoers down the right of ways and causing uh, backups and um, problems uh, in the neighborhood for that. And so uh, that, that's what number 11 is addressing. Um, we also said it was illegal to park any vehicles except a passenger car, motor vehicle, pickup truck, without protrusions or recreational vehicles measuring less than 20 feet in length at the Wells Beach parking lot known as Casino Square, the Gold Ribbon parking lot, the Gross parking lot. We added Gross parking lot here. Uh, at the Drake's Island parking lot, known as the Jetty parking lot, and we added, or in the designated parking spaces along the seawall from 321 to 435 Weber Hannett Drive. And then again in F, um, we put, um, it shall be legal to park or leave standing any recreational vehicle as defined in 212-3 definitions along the seawall uh, on Webb Hannett Drive from 11 p.m. until 6 a.m. We then, um, we, we then under one-way streets, uh, the committee um, worked hard down on Atlantic Avenue and the roads are so tight down there that it was felt that the road known as Riverside Drive, which is on the Harbor Marsh side of, of Atlantic Avenue, uh, should be made one way, the entire length. It connects down further towards the Eastern Shore parking lot. And um, one of the issues tonight that I would recommend to the board is to not make, not to go ahead and make this one way. Uh, I think uh, those people that live along that road ha should have a right to um, be heard individually on, on this um, uh, one-way street. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to um, add was the Web Hanna Drive that east between 321 to 435 Web Hanna Drive along the seawall is designated parking spaces. I think um, because of the tightness of time and the uh, issues we're going through with COVID-19, the parking on Web Hanna Drive should be left alone for right now and addressed um, in, the, in the coming year when we have time to actually physically go and mark uh, those spaces. And then uh, we added Main Street. Um, this is again, um, what this is, is uh, designated as parking zones. Um, Main Street, which is behind the new public safety complex, uh, east between South Street and Harbor Road would be uh, a parking area along the uh, road. Um, 
And then we got into um, cleanup of the towing of vehicles. And uh, Jerry, if you unmute yourself, uh, maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I'm back, hopefully. <clears throat> um, just wanted to, uh, to dress up the towing of vehicles uh, uh, so that uh, the only vehicles that we'd actually be towing uh, vehicles that represent a danger to the public by creating a hazardous or potentially hazardous condition uh, are obstructing a private or a public way uh, or obstruct access by fire or other emergency vehicles. And with the exception of uh, the last one, C, uh, a reasonable effort will be made to contact the registered owner of the vehicle prior to any towing. Uh, Normally, there's plenty of time to do that. Uh, but uh, the only uh, ex exception there would be if the vehicle is blocking uh, a road or an area where the fire department can't get in or an ambulance. At that point, if they can't get in, probably put a fire truck behind them and just push them out of the way. I mean, it's you don't have time to even wait for a, for a wrecker. But, uh, I, we've never had to tow a vehicle yet under these circumstances, so, uh, but it could happen, but if it does, you know, these are the reasons uh, why we can and how we do it. Um, and the next change was, uh, was in the violations and penalties. Uh, the uh, fine used to be $35 and increase it to 50 if paid within 30 days, only because $35 people would, would park wherever they wanted to and say, well, I'll just pay the fine because it's the same as if I parked in a parking lot someplace. So it only made sense to increase it to $50. Uh, and then if, uh, if after, $30, uh, or after 30 days uh, and before a court summons is issued, a civil penalty of a hundred dollars to be paid to the town or and police department. And we added something that uh, we see that uh, a lot of other towns have done, uh, and that a collection agency may be used at the discretion of the town to collect the money. Um, so that uh, in some uh, jurisdictions. Uh, they have a collection agency handle all of their their uh, fines so that they don't have to deal with it. Uh, but uh, we would only do that as a last resort. Um, then uh, moving ahead, the change here in parking exemptions. Um, it's just the vehicles uh, that are exempt from the town parking ordinance uh, include uh, the following when using the scope of their duties, emergency vehicles, police, fire, ambulance, EMT, uh, public utility vehicles, uh, water district, uh, cable company, telephone, power company, street maintenance, uh, any company that would have to come out and actually work on uh, wires of the street, uh, telephone poles, whatever, because of a hurricane or an accident. Uh, would be exempt. And vehicles uh, that are allowed uh, up to 15 minute parking when used in the scope of their employment, um, as long as they uh, don't prevent access to them for emergency vehicles. And there's, you know, we're fairly lenient here. Uh, there's no one going to sit the, with a, uh, with a, you know, a watch and, and uh, time 15 minutes. Um, so, but it includes ice cream trucks, commercial delivery vehicles, UPS, FedEx, uh, U.S. Postal, commercial service vehicles, um, which is a vehicle of which the principal use is the transportation of commodities, merchandise, produce, or freight, or is engaged in the plumbing, electrical construction, landscaping, refrigeration, or repair business or trade. So it pretty much covers about anything that that, uh, you know, a, a company for business that might have to come to your house to do some kind of work uh, and they have to park out on the seat, on the street, on the side of the road uh, in order to, uh, you know, to conduct their business. You know, it's 
long as they're off the street and they're not blocking traffic, you know, we, you know, we say 15 minutes, but, you know, we be reasonable here. I mean, uh, if they're not causing a problem, I mean, where else are they going to park? I mean, there's no way you can get a, uh, have a landscape or, you know, mow several lawns and take care of two or three houses in a row and only allow them to, to sit there for 15 minutes. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. So, um, and in certain cases, uh, and this would be one of them, if somebody was building a house and uh, having the construction done and there were vehicles parked off the side of the road, really not interfering with traffic, um, we gave the, uh, the chief of police, may at his or her discretion, uh, provide temporary exemptions. Uh, from the town parking ordinance for the purpose of accommodating public events, for functions, and during emergency situations, uh, for humanitarian reasons or other special circumstances. Uh, it pretty much covers everything. Um, and a special circumstance would be, you know, if there was uh, somebody building a house, having construction done or work, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and Moving along, um, I believe that was it for uh, Chapter 212. Um, I don't know, did you uh, talk about 201 and the side? Yes, yes we did. So, Mr. Chairman, our, uh, the staff's recommendation and the committee's, uh, well, the committee didn't do this recommendation, but our recommendation is to pass the ordinance uh, as amended, 201-212, with the exception in 212 on Riverside Drive, making that one way, and the parking on Webb Hannock. Hey, what about Main Street? You said no, that was okay though, right? Yes. Okay, yep, I got the other two. Just a, a clarification question for you, Jerry. Uh, when you're going to use, if you're going to use a collection agency, are you going to add the cost of the collection agency into the fine? Yes. Okay. Uh, just a Any quick questions question. from the board? Yeah, just a quick question. So this, if I'm understanding the sidewalk use, that would preclude, for example, say, you know, a three or four year old kid with training wheels in their bike from riding their bike ahead of their parents. Am I reading that correct? Uh, technically, yes. But um, again, you know, there are a lot of laws on the books uh, and you know we are supposed to use common sense to enforce them and i like to think that we do and uh you know it, if you had your situation your hypothetical situation if it was on a sidewalk say, east of route one i mean i'm sorry west of route one or along route one it's a lot different than it is in the middle of the summertime on a sidewalk down to the beach where you've got a lot of people walking and you know, that sort of thing. I mean, somebody could get hurt, uh, you know, kid could fall down, run out into the road with traffic. So uh, you know, that's the reasoning behind that. Yeah, my concern is I just want to make sure that we're creating a family friendly atmosphere that if it weren't a safety issue that, you know, we wouldn't be telling parents, oh, you know, you can't go out there with, you know, that to me seems a safe place as any for a kid to learn how to ride a bike with training wheels. I mean, a little kid, not a, you know, some rambunctious teenager out with a BMX bike grinding on all the, you know, the rails or whatever. So. Yeah, right. Uh, and I would think that I would hope that the uh, people would have common sense enough to realize that you know, teaching a kid to ride on a little tricycle uh, bicycle with training wheels on, on a busy sidewalk uh, on the beach or along the beach is probably not a wise thing to do. I mute myself, sorry. Um, some people like that. Um, I, I have a question that pertains to that because I, I'm, I'm picturing, I'm looking at Wells Beach having grown up there. I think there's about a hundred yards from Oxcart Motel to the Beachcomber. There's about a 25 yard strip from Driftwinds Hotel down, well, maybe it's a hundred yards down to Atlantic Motor Inn. And then you're gonna have to tell me where the rest of the sidewalks are on Wells Beach. Oh, around the Casino Square, there's one little one. There's no other sidewalks. Well, the, the, 
the sidewalk from the hotels over to the other hotels along the ocean. Yeah, that's what I mean, around the casino square. Yeah. Yeah, that, so, I mean, we're talking about 800 feet of, 800 yards of sidewalk, right? Right. We just don't have beach sidewalks. I, I love that beach sidewalks. We don't have them, right? Well, the, you have designated sidewalks all along Atlantic Avenue, all along Web Hannon. But if we, if we prevent bikes from riding in that way, you can't ride the bikes where are they going to go? In the road? In the middle of the road? I mean, I do that all the time. I ride my bike. It, that, that's the only place I can go. With two cars right. coming at me, I, I got nowhere to go. Well, <clears throat> bicycles aren't supposed to ride on sidewalks. They're supposed to follow uh, actually uh, in Title 29A of the motor vehicle laws that tells you, uh, it instructs people how to ride a, a bicycle and they have to follow uh, the same rules that a, a vehicle operator would use as far as where to ride, uh, signals and, you know, safety issues, that sort of thing. No, I, I, I do understand that, Jerry, but you know Atlantic Ave as well as I do. When there's two cars and, and cars parked in the driveways, I, I will tell you, I hit a car once on, because he backed out of the driveway and I had nowhere to go. There's nowhere else for those bikes to, I just think we're making a rule that makes it very unsafe or it's gonna make bikes go in the middle of the road and then people are gonna get mad at bikers, which they always do anyway. I, I just, I think we're making a rule that, I don't know, I, I that it, it scares should, me. Yeah. Should it be only raised sidewalks, Jerry? Well, uh, that's up to you. I mean, the, the, the town has designated sidewalks, whether they be raised or marked out with, uh, you know, with paint. Uh, and they, you know, they're enforced the same. I like the idea of just doing it on uh, raised sidewalks and not um, flat road designated sidewalks. Right. Because otherwise, it seems to me that's the, where a lot of people, even on nine, here on my road at 9A, you have the stripes along the side. Are those considered bike? It doesn't say it's a bike path. I mean, that's why I would consider that people mostly ride, not out in the road. Uh, and along your road, that's, those are probably just fog lines. You know, to, so people can see where the edge of the road is. I don't Believe, uh, the bike lanes are usually about three wide at a minimum. I, I just feel that, I mean, I think we had a fatality on Atlantic Ave a, couple, a year or two ago, and the guy was in the road, right? And that's what caused the accident, I thought. But if he had stayed to the side, and I'm not positive on that, but I'm just, I, these things worry me with, for bikers, because there's a lot of bikers on Wells Beach. I mean, a ton every day and I know you guys deal with it all the time I'm sure route one I completely understand I, your bike shouldn't be riding on the route one sidewalks that, that makes it dangerous for the pedestrians that are using that road but I just think down the beach the raised sidewalks I agree whole, wholeheartedly but those non-raised sidewalks I I struggle with any other comments from the board well, how would you put that in there? We, it would have to, if you would, if we wanted to change that, it would have to be um, the exception is that bicycles, ba bicycles are only exempt from raised sidewalks. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, since this is a public hearing, there may be some people with questions out there. Yeah, I was going to ask Brittany if she had any at this point. There are some questions. Um, related to this topic. So um, one question sort of on the road topic here is how does a Wells resident go about requesting to have stop signs added into their residential neighborhood at certain intersections? Um, the, the, the problem is uh, the question has a lot of open ends here. If it's a subdivision there is a site plan on record that records where the stop signs are to be placed. There is an ordinance uh, as part of uh, chapter, it's not 212, but the other traffic one, 
that has a database of stop signs. So um, the person can request it. We would then look at the subdivision that this road may be in. We would evaluate with the police department whether a stop sign is, is necessary and, and proceed from there. All right, um, another question. How are we supposed to know which ones are designated sidewalks? Well, if, if the change is made to raise sidewalks, that should be it. There's another a, question. I was just gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I was just gonna add to that. Uh, down on Web Hannock, uh, there's a sidewalk. It's about three to four feet wide. It's not raised, it's uh, outlined with paint. And there are signs there that say, do not park in sidewalk. So the sidewalk does not have to be raised to be a sidewalk. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's that difficult to determine, you know, if, if something is a sidewalk or not. I mean, I think, okay. Oh. Go ahead, Kathy, sorry. Okay, I, I just think, um, I understand what you're saying, Jerry, and I, I can see that, but it, raised sidewalks are really the ones that we don't want them on. I think mm -hmm. would be the one that we would, you know, other than that, it's, it, it's, it's gonna be 20 seconds of on and off for somebody to go around on those. So, but the raised sidewalks are definitely, I think, geared towards walking only. That's that's fine. You know, it's whatever the uh, majority want. I mean, if anybody just the floor. Floor. Yeah. Other questions, Brittany? Yep. Um, there's a question. I think it's more of a clarification. So we can't ride bikes down Atlantic Ave. What? No. 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 We didn't say that. No. Uh, Atlantic. You can ride bikes down Atlantic Avenue. Yes, that's right. You you can ride them. It's allowed. Um, another question: Can we have bike lanes made on the road? We we are trying to as as DOT uh, works with us. We are beginning to uh, make those uh, designations. You'll see some of that up on exit nineteen. Um, and some of the different improvements DOT is making uh, in town. But in reality, there has to be enough width to do that on our roads. And uh, that, that has been the big stumbling point uh, here. Yeah. Um, another question is um, asking about handicap parking. What about it? That was the question, it was open-ended. What about handicap parking? We do have a lot of handicap parking. Um, at the beach parking lots, we have um, quite a bit of it. Um, it's listed in the next thing that we talk about, right? I, well, no, that's the beach parking pass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Did I feel that? I we we do address uh, handicap parking where we can. We're uh, providing additional handicap parking down at the end of Drake's Island Road. Um, where where we can, uh, we have extended it. But unless there's a specific uh, area that the party asking the question about, I I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, um, another question. Do these changes affect electric personal assistive mobility devices? By state law, they're allowed to be on the sidewalks and roads up to 35 miles per hour. Correct. The, the uh, personal safety or transportation device, they basically uh, a segue and they were made for that purpose. Uh, and that's why it's defined that way. And yes, they're, they're to be considered the, the similar to a wheelchair. Uh, so a 
if somebody uh, needs one to uh, to get around, they can ride it on a sidewalk. They can ride in a building. You know, anywhere they, uh, a wheelchair would go. All right. Um, what about Harbor Road new sidewalks? How will that be enforced? Uh, in in what way? The uh, aren't we building some soon? Yeah, we are. Uh, but what what is the question? That's just the question there. What about Harbor Road new sidewalks? How will they be enforced? Um, it's from Dennis. Dennis, if you want to elaborate on that. My guess is he's probably asking when they're going to be. I'm not seeing these things, but I'm just. No, I, they're going to be exempt from bicycles and I the other stuff. Yeah, how will we regulate That's that? that? That's what I think he's asking. Yeah, it's it's going to be in compliance with regular um, sidewalk issues. Uh, and those are those are raised, right? A little bit. No, there they'll be You're just dirt. 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 Well. It may be dirt. Um, well, all right. you're not going to buy skateboarders on them then, Emily. Yeah. When are that we doing those? When are, can I ask that, John, now? I'm sorry. When are we doing sidewalks down the Harbor Road? Um, right now, we're projecting bidding the project out if we can get all the OKs in uh, the fall. We, we had a question come in on Zoom. Um, in reference to bikes on sidewalks, what about children walking with their families, like little children um, using race sidewalks on Route 1? And what about an individual with a disability? Um, we have somebody in town that, an adult that rides a tricycle and he does have a disability. What are, what are the thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> um, if it's a, I, I, I'm not really sure if I've seen it or not. If it's a, an extended tricycle that you, they almost uh, lay down on. Is that what you're talking it's a, about? Or? It's a tricycle. Or a common bicycle. Or? It's a tricycle. It, it's a, it's a large, very large tricycle, yeah. and the, you know, the family member is walking next to them as they go down the sidewalk? Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, if it's that big, if there are other people on the sidewalk, uh, maybe it shouldn't be on the sidewalk. But at the same time, you know, if the person is uh, disabled, uh, being on the side of the road isn't such a good idea either. So, you know, I, I would say that offhand that, uh, you know, that uh, they could ride on the sidewalk and you know, if there's some marking on them that shows that they are uh, handicapped, uh, you know, people would have to go around them, I guess. I mean, it's either that you can say, no, you can't ride on the sidewalk and make them ride in the road, which I think is a worse situation for everybody. Can I just say something? I Honestly, there, there's no way you're gonna pass anything that's ever gonna cover 100% of every single situation. I think this is where common sense comes in. You watch a parent walk in their child or the child is riding prices down the sidewalk. I don't know of anyone who's walking who's going to be offended with that. I just don't. And I, so I think, you know, no more, you know, you're going to look at that and maybe that happens. Or the person that's walking down the road to the post office with their, with their kids driving their little electric Jeep or something right beside them. I mean, I, you know, those, again, those are exceptions. Those are not the rule. That's not what you're going to see 99.9% .9 of the time. So I think in some cases you're just going to have and to. I, I agree with Kathy on this. And I, yeah. I just think we train our, our police. I, I give credit to right. you guys for training the police to have common sense. When, I mean, I can't imagine any police officer in our department knowing most of them. Driving down Route 1, seeing a little kid on a, on a power vehicle next to his father going to the post office, pulling him over. I mean... That would be a great video to show on Facebook or something, but I, I you know, I, I just don't see, I just don't see that ever happening. I, I mean, I'd hope, God, that that would be terrible for us, that kind of 
behavior. And I know that's not the way they're trained, Jerry and Joanne, that are sitting here, and, and Chris. So. Could we just have a provision that says at the officer's discretion or something similar to what we had for, you know, the chief of police having exemptions for contractors, just something because 20, we all understand this, but 20 years from now, is somebody going to go back and go, no, that's not, we got to follow the letter of the law. You know what I mean? Can we just get something like that in there just to clarify it? Well, I think if, I think the chief has, instructed his pe her people that it's discretionary right i i think yeah you can't i don't think you can walk it down i think the intent of this whole ordinance is to address most of the problems that occur that the people that are running in like a pack of them running down you know bicycles riding down the sidewalk or, or people just pushing you know i i think it's just either but i think it's meant to a to a the biggest problems or issues that are out there. I'll, I'll follow up on that, Kathy, just from a standpoint, having sat on the committee, countless hours that this committee put in trying to address so many situations, the, the work they did, uh, along with what the Captain Cognon did and Sally, the intent behind this was certainly to clarify things to make it easier for enforcement issues that need to be enforced. And again, what you guys uh, have both said between Tim and yourself, common sense, uh, obviously, you know, the, the chief has a discretion. If somebody was abused on a wrongful written ticket or something, the chief can oversee that. So I think that, but certainly the work of the committee was to try to address uh, exactly the, the discretionary powers of the police to make it easier for them to enforce things when they really need to. I agree. Okay. Um, we did have one or a couple other questions here. Um, yeah. This question here says, with all the parking closed, closed to the beaches, why are they closed to people who can walk the beach? Maybe that question could be asked at open to the public. Okay. Um, and then there was one other question about um, residential passes for the beach, but we can save that for open yep. to the public as well. Right. And that was all on the sidewalks. Good. Anything else from the board? No. I did have a quick question. Um, I think last time we had talked about this, but does this also include like the, um, when we're talking about the side roads down at the beach, does this, this ordinance also covers like kids playing catch in, in those streets, right? Because I think we, a couple of us had said last time that we didn't agree with that, that these side streets barely get any traffic and they should still be allowed to be recreated in. And I wanted to, I was reading through it and I didn't see it this time around, but I remember we had talked about it last time that um, that we should leave, or some of us said that we should leave those streets out of, out of this uh, equation here. Uh, the, the, only question, the only issue I have there, uh, Sean, is there's always the one, the people that push it, to push the issue and again it's discretion i mean if you see two little kids down there again it should fall under the office discretion if they're you know you know father and son out there playing i don't have an issue with it but maybe right. the, uh, there might be some underlying thing if someone calls and complains um, so there's always that but then uh, if we go ahead and allow it the car comes around the corner and runs over a child who do you think they're going to be coming after? They're going to be coming after you guys for allowing such a thing, or the town of Wells. So I'm just a little skeptical on, on that. Again, I think discretion should, uh, should dictate here, but or common sense. Two things, I, I, I hate the bad, but I, I would think the driver would be responsible for coming around the corner that fast. But um, the, the other thing is, I agree. I, and I, again, I think our discretion, our police department has been very good um because I, I know on my side street that's all we there's unreal pickleball games go on every day and nobody cares nobody you know i mean it's yeah. they have a pickleball court set up you block it and if a car comes you pick up the net you run the other way and the car goes down and these are very small side streets they're not there's no traffic on them there's 10 cars go out if 10 cars go down them during the day yeah. you know that's that's what happens so i, I would hope the same discretion i mean I, sean and i played catch our whole lives in that, in our, you know, road. Um, played basketball on Church Street. It's a dead end. And we played street hockey. <laughs> we did play basketball on Church Street. Don't mention that. Um, 
Well, I, my guess is, you know, we've lived with a an ordinance for probably 25 years that hasn't been amended. We amend it and see what issues come up and go from there. And again, a lot of it is common sense, you know, that's all. So it's a pleasure of the board. Do you want to uh, pass the ordinance as written, but taking out the uh, yeah okay. one way of what pan at the parking situation there and the Riverside Drive? Was there something else, John? And Rain then bicycles, sidewalk. just bicycles will not be allowed on race sidewalks. Period. Yeah. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so I move to approve the amendments to Chapter Two Twelve and Two Hundred One as discussed during the public hearing. Eliminating the change to Riverside Drive, Wapenet Drive, and adding bicycles will not be allowed on race sidewalk. Second. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you for that. And I would like to thank the parking committee for yes, thank you. They put in. To, they did yeoman's work, and we'll be meeting again. I'm sure to be to, to discuss the what we didn't talk about tonight. Hopefully, when we don't have to do it in a Zoom meeting, but we can do it back in. Carl, can I just address something real quick? Um, sure. I just want people to understand. There's there's a lot of chatter on the side that about just move on. This is silly. Get to summer. You know all this stuff. We still have to run our town, <laughs> and do these things for our town. The, our selectmen have to do these things for the town, like the next one and and, and budget stuff. The, the town doesn't stop. I, I get you all are anxious to hear about the summer stuff and all that stuff, but we still have to run our town. We don't have a choice to do that. You know, this is, this is what we're doing. So we'll get to it. We didn't, we're not hiding. We're going to get to it, but we have to run our town first. Yeah. This is the nuts and bolts of what we do. You know? If nothing else, we'll move on to our next public hearing, which is amending the 2020 beach parking policy to be held April 21st, which is today. Um, not on 208 Sanford Road, but by Zoom meeting. John. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and, and, and public, uh, again, this, this is an annual uh, document that gets updated um, to allow uh, a clear understanding of how we operate the summer beach parking um, areas and how the beach parking passes are, are given out. Um, this got involved into the uh, traffic and parking committee. And um, so it was part of their task to work with, with Sally and Jody and, and um, who are on the front lines of the uh, beach uh, parking uh, policies and, and passes uh, to uh, work to update the um, policy for this year with a recommendation back to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, in their document, which again for the public can be found under public hearings on the Selectmen's page, uh, what we are doing is to um, look at um, under time, these are amendments under the timeshare ordinance uh, ownership, rather. Um, it, it says uh, after the flat fee of $40 per vehicle instead of, instead of the week, um, they were charged um, on a weekly basis because many of the timeshares were on, are on a weekly basis. Um, and then it goes on to say for each week that they are occupying their timeshare unit. Um, and then it, it goes again to that same language for the odd even year timeshare ownership uh, issues. On um, page three of seven, um, under section three, taxpayer seasonal um, beach stickers, uh, we under fee, it will be $40 per vehicle. So if you have two vehicles, it's 40 would be for the second vehicle also. Um, the time frame for uh, purchasing uh, stickers would be uh, the first Monday in May, uh, which would be May 4th this year. Um, 
and that the property tax account status for issuance property taxes cannot be in arrears. Taxes must be paid for all committed taxes at time of issuance. And then section four, mooring holders. Um, we had a great deal of discussion uh, both at the uh, committee level, but also with uh, a couple of the informational sessions with the Board of Selectmen uh, on the area at the Eastern Shore parking lot that is designated uh, for the uh, boat boaters who have moorings over on the Eastern Shore parking lot side. Um, it came down to um, and I believe an agreement that um, the wording is Monday through Friday, uh, there's 30 spaces in this carve out area that Monday through Friday, there would be um, 15, uh, there would be, let's see, 10, more for 10, on the weekdays available to for mooring holders would be 10 and 20 for taxpayer beach stickers and on the weekends it would be 15 spaces for the mooring holders and 15 for the taxpayer beach stickers the um, next session section pass issuance transferability and replacement we've added Vehicle ownership that paid for an original sticker who receives new plates for the vehicle that was originally permitted would pay $5 uh, for the change. Um, and then we added, um, if sticker is lost or damaged, a new sticker may be purchased for, um, $5, is that? Says I'm pretty sure for, for forty, John. Forty, forty dollars. I okay. it's crossed. Boy, yes. Just, uh, the the town is not responsible for any lost or damaged stickers. Uh, rates at all parking lots are four dollars an hour at the meters, and the time um, at the parking lot is eight a.m. to seven p.m. Uh, Tokens each are $4. And um, again, the um, times uh, of the parking lot is spelled out 8 a.m. to um, through, through 8 p.m. Um, under section seven, we have a uh, location of, of beach parking lots. Um, we've added 10% of the spaces in each paid lot will be set aside for taxpayer beach sticker vehicles. Section eight is terms of stickers. Um, we've added all purchases of mooring pass holder stickers described in section four are for the calendar year in which they were purchased. The new pass is to be placed on the designated vehicle for every calendar year. And then um, this is we, under disability, parking designated disability parking spaces, we've added five spots at the intersection of Drake's Island Road and, in, and Island Beach Road. Um, and Mr. Chairman, that is uh, all the changes. John, I had a quick question for you. Um, we had talked about the, um, briefly last time about having 10% of the parking uh, in each of the beach lots for sticker holders, and then potentially having uh, a spot or two in lots for veteran parking as well. Um, is that something that we can add in if the the board all agrees. Absolutely, for veterans, it did not um, get amended. Okay. So two, did you say two at each parking? 
I, I thought that would be a good idea. If, Two if spaces at each it. lot, right? Right. I, yeah, I would think so, yeah. And then and then the 10%, right? I thought we discussed this last time, no? I, I, yeah, I thought that. Yeah, I, think I, I, I read, read the 10%. That's on there. The 10%'s on there. Okay. Other questions from the board? No. Brittany, any questions from the public? Um, yes. So I'll just stick to all the questions on beach parking and beach stickers and then save the rest for open to the public. Is that? Correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, can we let residents only on the beach? I mean, this could be one that we save for open to the public, but you, you let me know. Can we let residents only on the beach and give anyone without a residential pass a ticket? We'll do that in the next section under okay. open to the public. Okay. Um, someone's asking here, um, what is the cost of a beach sticker? Um, as I said earlier, $40. Okay. Um, there was a question here about the hours and said 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. I hope that does not apply to stickers, only meter question mark. I think it's the only time it's paid is eight to seven and you can park there whatever the lot's open to i don't know the hours what the 11 or 10. the parking lots are open till 11. the that eight to seven was stimulate right when it when they charge pay to park the last hour we would charge for is seven o'clock then free after that for all those spots yes thank you um if there's a delay in opening the beach, will there be a decrease in cost of beach parking passes? No. Um, I think those are the only questions about this topic. I'm saving the rest for open to the public. Any other questions or comments from the board then? I saw one other just come in. What about harbor parking? Is anyone going to enforce that for us commercial fishermen? I'm not sure I understand the question. Russell, could you clarify the question in the comments if you could? Is that on Zoom or Facebook, Sean? Uh, that's on the Wells Main Police uh, Facebook stream. The commercial guys, um, We'll get a, uh, a sticker, uh, mooring sticker, if they're over on that side. But that's only one. Um, their customers will have to pay to park. Um, and or they can be instructed that their clientele meet them on the eastern shore uh, and the commercial boat goes over, uh, not the eastern shore, the western shore and pick up the passengers and there's free parking over on that side i think he's talking other. the harbor he, side. he's a commercial lobsterman so i think he's talking on the harbor side and he just clarified and he said usually there's no open spots for us fishermen when we get down there and i think he's talking about the, the harbor side not the eastern shore uh, so i it seems like he's implying that there's other people that shouldn't be parking there taking up spots or something like i don't know um specifically but that's what it sounds like Well, it's always filled with beach walkers and restaurant customers, et cetera. Any other questions? Yes, a couple others came in. Um, do handicap plates need a sticker? No. Um, another question here. Does 10% parking spots for beach passes mean that beach pass parking is not allowed in the other portion? I was waiting for someone to ask that question. No, not at all. <laughs> All it means is that the parking lot attendants have to be on their toes to allow more beach sticker parking than meters. So yeah, at least 10% is designated for the beach pass, but any of the others can, if you have a beach pass and you get there before everybody else, you can park there, right? Right, first come, first serve. I mean, there's gonna be some designations on the unpaved parking areas 
for uh, designated uh, beach stickers that if, if we allow 146 at the gross lot, then 10% of that is 15, we'll, we'll uh, designate an area that only beach sticker people can park in. Hmm. Right, you'll have a sign, right? I mean, there'll yeah. be a sign saying resident passes only here, right? right. I mean, you wouldn't have to like say, okay, you're a resident, that's four cars. So I, I gotta make, we're just saying there's signs in certain places that residents right. Only, right? Okay. A resident passes only. So right. what we're saying is people, if they're, it's all vacant there and uh, a meter person wants to park there, they really can't because it's designated for beach parking uh, stickers. More questions are coming in now. Um, did the time for pay parking get extended because um, there was thought that it ended at five last year? Yeah. It, did, yes. it did get extended. Okay. Um, a few more questions coming in. I know we already answered this, but perhaps we can just reiterate the answer. Is the handicap, is um, beach parking for Handicapped free. Yes. Um, will the attendants leave spaces for stickers even on the hot packed days? Yes. Be areas just designated for stickers. Will there be resident parking only? You gotta have a sticker. Right. Um, question here on lifeguards. Will they be there up to 7 p.m.? No. All right, just looking through to make sure I got everything. I think you that's- you want to charter boats, Brittany? Um, oh yes, from Michelle. Yes. Give me one second. Um, what are the rules about charter boat customer parking? They take up a lot of more in parking spots. The charter boat uh, customers are to be metered harder parking uh, if they don't have a town sticker. Um, so um, they have to park in the general parking lot on the Eastern shore, or uh, if the captain says park over on the uh, western shore they can park in at the harbor park for free and be be picked up on the western side the main pier uh, but customers of charter boats need to be parked uh, and paid at the meter um, another question here is there free parking for veterans um, we just uh, will be amending this, uh, we may be amending this tonight to include uh, veterans parking, two parking spaces in each of the parking lots. Yep. All right, I think that's it as it relates to this subject, but I will keep monitoring. Do you think in the, in the future we could, we could ask, um, John, I know you're on the Harbor Committee, um, would it be smart of us to say that all charter fishing boats customers, not the charter fishing captains, customers park on the harbor and it has to be picked up over there? That way they're not taking up spots to the beach and not, you know, I mean, it, it seems, and it's free. So, I mean, it would be the only town in, in, on the coast that I know of that would have free parking for charter guests, you know what I mean? So. I think with the Harbor Master's plan that he had that um, I think that's what they're shooting for down there by the sounds of it. So he was doing a good job with that, laying that out. So I just think that would make sense and, and would save parking spots for the beach on the eastern shore rather than putting charter boats over there. You know what I mean? And I, if there's a reason why not, I, I'm, I'm fine to listen to it, but I'd just like to have that talked about at some point. Um, a question came over Zoom about the time frame for having dogs on the beach. It's uh, in our ordinance and in the signage uh, down there, it's um, early morning um, and then it has to be off by, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, Chief, do you know? Um, 
8 a.m. 8 a.m. So you can walk your dogs on leash, on leash until uh, 8 a.m. And then you can come back. Is it after five, Chief? Six. Six. Okay, a couple new questions coming in. Um, how will you decipher who's a veteran and not? Are you looking at their plates? Um, some people here are saying, um, you know, someone in their family is a veteran, but they don't have veteran plates. So if, you know, how will you determine whether or not someone is a veteran? Just trust that what they're stating is true. Let's hope people are more honest and happen to go just based on veteran plates, because not everyone has veteran plates that is a veteran. It's just like a veteran discount at any store. It's just trusted. I, I would hope if the rest of the board agrees. It's pretty um, sad. If we can't trust him. Got to say he's a veteran and give him a spark in place. So I, I would agree with you, Sean. Or her. Or her. Or her. Sorry. <laughs> um, another question here. Can residents send in parking pass info now or do we have to wait until May 4th? Well, that's a good segue. Um, we were going to bring this up in the Corbett uh, 19 stuff, but maybe Jody, uh, Jody and I and, and others have been working uh, on trying to uh, automate the sticker program this year. Uh, we do 6,000 of these stickers. Um, and so with such a short time period that we need to get these out, and we can't have 6,000 people come to town hall. Um, we've uh, worked with our uh, sticker company, Ryden, um, and I'll let Jody talk about that. Uh, so the town manager and myself have been working with Ryden Decal to get a program that we can offer to um, people that qualify for beach stickers that they could obtain them online and the sticker company would actually be the fulfillment center and mailing those stickers directly to the individuals that are requesting the stickers. But we will not be able to roll that program out till the 1st of May. So anybody that would like to purchase that way, we're asking them to hold off and not send any mail into the town of Wells. You'd be doing it all online. Um, with your, you'd be creating an account and putting in your information. And then that database would be able to be accessed by my staff and the police department staff. Um, Any other uh, questions, Rodney? Yes. Um, what do you need to establish residency for a beach permit if you're a new resident? They have to be able to prove that they are a taxpayer. So if they have not received a tax bill from the town of Wells, they're going to be working with the assessor's office and if the assessor's office will be picking them up that they would receive a tax bill in the fall, the assessor's office gives us the okay to issue the beach sticker. Um, another question here, would you ever consider making a small parking lot at Wells Beach for residents only? It's free parking and it's usually filled very early. Meter parking for non-residents at the playground. It's it. We have 6,000 stickers and only 500, less than 500 spaces. Um, and it's a very difficult situation. Um, the parking and traffic committee has a number of ideas for parking lots that we have put off because of uh, everything right now and the time frame. In order to do this, you got to have the plans in hand in November, by November, to actually implement them in, in the spring. Um, and we don't have that time this year. Um, and I think um, that's, a, that's a question that will be addressed maybe uh, during the summer and later fall when, when the parking lot committee gets back together again. Okay, a few other questions here. Um, one, if we do it online, how do we receive the sticker and will there be any additional fees? The sticker is sent directly to the uh, address that you fill out on the form. 
Um, and if you do it online, how do you show proof of residence? The, we, we provide Ryden with a database, uh, particularly the last year's sticker database, and it is matched up against that. Uh, the form that you will fill out on online will ask you for your tax parcel account from your tax bill. Another John question. Is also going to link their, they'll have to put their name and their parcel ID. Another question here. Have we ever thought of limiting the hours parked at Casino Square? Um, Casino Square is a shared parking lot. It's half owned by Lafayette and half owned by the town. Um, there's a question here on um, whether or not a resident can receive a parking pass. They're, they say their condo is open 10 months a year in Wells and they pay taxes. Does that make them seasonal and are they allowed a resident pass? Can you clarify the name of the pass? The pass is called the Taxpayer Seasonal Beach Pass. So it's anybody who's paying taxes, not just resident pa um, passes. Thank you for saying that. All right. Um, if nothing else, don't think so. The board, I'll take a motion. Um, I make a motion to approve the beach parking policy for 2020 and two parking spots at each parking lot that will be designated for a veteran. And the 10, is the 10% already in there? I'm sorry. Yes, it's, it's already, in there. already in there. Yeah. Second. Sorry, second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero, thank you. Next two that we have for public hearings is William Irish doing business at Food and Drink, 2073 Post Road Wells, application for a full-time malt, venice, and spiritus liquor license, a special entertainment uh, permit. Both of these are new. Any questions uh, on these from the board? None. I move to close the public hearings and grant the licenses. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero, thank you. Moving on now to the town COVID-19 update. We have the update from the manager on issues from the last meeting and from the federal and state COVID policies and directions. Before I turn this over to you, John, uh, I wanted to start with thanking people for the volume of information that we have been receiving. I've gotten hundreds of emails from folks. I will say the majority of them, if not uh, close to all of them, very positive. We've received some new information as to what's uh, some good ideas. So we're getting not just detriment. But with that being said, we've received some, I'll say not so nice, rather horrific emails that have been directed at our town manager. And for clarity purposes, John answers to the Board of Selectmen. Everything that he does, for the most part, is all run through the board and authorized by the board to do it. It is unfair for him to be the brunt of some of these nasty emails. And I wanted to be clear that this board supports him and his actions, and he follows the guidelines that we're giving him. So if you have information that you'd like to share, please send it to the board. You can put it to my direction if you'd like to. But uh, for clarity purposes, He's not the target in all this, folks. This is uh, life and death situations. We're doing the best we can with the information that we have. And when it's a nasty situation, like we've seen some of these emails that have come in, I think they're rather uncalled for. So I just wanted to start this information session off with that. Um, if you have something positive to say, thank you. And if you don't, then please leave it to yourself. That being said, John, I'll turn it over to you. Well, um, on the agenda, there's a couple of items um, for updates. Uh, update on Governor, Governor Mills's orders. Um, she has um, issued, since we last uh, met, the no eviction um, ordinance. 
Uh, she has um, also uh, made clear when the uh, primary election uh, will be, which is uh, July 14th. Uh, we will be acting uh, with our town attorney tonight on, on orders to uh, move our town meeting from uh, June 9th to June 14th, June 14th, uh, July 14th, sorry. Um, and um, she has um, been asked by local governments um, to give as much notice as possible uh, before her April 30th deadline uh, when she's going to make a decision to extend uh, other orders that have uh, been in force, such as the stay at home, the lodging, um, and all of the essential um, issues that she has issued uh, many, many orders on. Um, that is only one week away. And it is going to be uh, very difficult to, um, uh, for her to wait much longer than uh, next week to do something. Uh, so uh, we will be taking up as an agenda item down uh, later in the uh, meeting, the July 14th uh, uh, Board of Selectmen's uh, town meeting order. We will uh, be also uh, discussing um, at that time, um, extending the payment of uh, the second part of the taxes, the real estate taxes, uh, from May 26 to June 26 for a month uh, free of interest um, to help uh, people out. Um, we also want to talk about the short-term rental registration program that the board has um, asked us to uh, look at. Uh, we have, uh, uh, through the help of um, several different people, we've looked at a program that is being used in Portland, South Portland, and throughout the country um, to identify short-term rental properties and to put them through a, a registration program once an ordinance is uh, put in place. Um, what we're asking tonight, and I've shared the information with all of, all of the Board of Selectmen, uh, and with many uh, other folks, we would like permission from the board to continue our investigation of this uh, program and to uh, bring it back um, with more information uh, to the board. What they did in their presentation to us uh, last week was to identify as of April 1, 566 short-term rental properties in the town of Wells. Most of them are uh, full houses. Many of them are condos. Many are utilizing the different platforms of rental. Um, and that's how this program operates. It looks at 50 to 60 website uh, platforms, VRBO, uh, Airbnb, um, and many others that um, I didn't know existed. Um, and they come up with a um, actual map of where these short-term rentals are. And they have a full program of, um, of how they identify it with enforcement uh, letters and, and so forth like that. And I know um, our town attorney um, has, um, We'll be sitting in on uh, another update uh, webinar with this company this, this coming Thursday, as well as some business people in town. Um, and it, uh, it's an interesting program. I've, I've never seen anything quite like it before. If everyone's had a chance to review what was in our selections packet, I would uh, suggest that we authorize the town manager and staff to continue uh, investigating it and bring it back at a later date. Do you want that motion now? 
If everyone's in agreement, then yes. I make a motion we authorize the town manager to do just that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero, thank you. The um, next item uh, for discussion is the reopening of the community um, discussions and ideas from the business community. We asked um, our chamber director, Eleanor Vazanay, to uh, reach out to her members and other business uh, uh, people in, in the community to um, talk and make their comments back to the Board of Selectmen uh, on how they see their businesses uh, reopening in our community and what is necessary for the town to reopen uh, and how they would suggest we reopen. Um, it is a um, about a eight page uh, document um, that uh, was mailed out and it is again on the selectmen's website page um, as a drop down people can uh, review it um, but it is um, they were asked what steps you are considering to reopen your business what safeguards do you anticipate you have to adhere to are you anticipating that the state municipality will enact safety guidelines? What concerns do you have for your employees? What plans do you have to alert your customers? And um, I think the business community stepped up and um, really gave some good answers back to uh, the Board of Selectmen. Yeah, there were some great ideas and some great suggestions. Um, um, going all through that reading, it was excellent. Thank you, all the businesses that that responded. I would I would ask that we now say though that um, because the chamber has, doesn't represent, I don't think even the majority of our businesses anymore. No. If you're listening and you didn't get this, to please email John and you you'd like to say it because I had I had one hotel owner call me, you know, and say, hey, I, I'm not part of the chamber, but I would have liked to an answer how to do that and and maybe understand better and. And a lot of our restaurants weren't on it. I felt um, while they did a good job, I'm not, please don't take it as a slight. I just think there's a majority of businesses in our town were not on it. Um, and we'd like to hear from them as, as we look at when we reopen. Beach Acre Campground was one and um, I, I sent along that um, to the board. Mm -hmm. Yep. Saw that. Yeah. I think the other thing that there should be mentioned so I think this was a question from last week um, some of us have had a discussion uh, obviously that uh, our governors and surrounding communities and states uh, are coordinating their discussions so that one state doesn't open before another potentially and create havoc and, and along with those same, uh, same thought pattern uh, we've had John behind the scenes basically talking with Kittery to Old Orchard Beach and all the beach communities so that no one has an unfair advantage of opening before someone else or causing disruption because we might open one beach and nobody else has it open and then have such an influx. So I think it's prudent that the folks at home know that between the governors and the town managers, uh, we're trying to coordinate this along with uh, making sure that the cleanliness factor and the safety of all people, not just the people arriving or that will be arriving, but the, the servers and the people that are the workers to support the businesses in town, their safety is also taken into serious consideration. Yeah, you know, I thought, I thought uh, today there was an article with Sununu uh, Baker and um, Mills have had that discussion uh, and Sununu said it best, I felt was that, um, you know, in order to coordinate the three states, it would be, you know, good for everyone. Because if, like he said, if he opened up Hampton Beach, but Massachusetts and Maine didn't open, Hampton Beach would be a madhouse and he wouldn't know how to handle that. The same as if we decided to open ours and, and everybody came up here, we wouldn't know how to, you know, so I think if we could get some kind of coordination, I don't think it's going to be expertise coordination because I, I'm sure there's, there's different things, but at least they're having that conversation. 
And, uh, you know, I think that's a good thing so that we know when and if we can open it up. Right. And I think that's a good point. Um, some of the information that people asked me, one of them was, I mean, if we open it up, there's going to be all kinds of people right here. If, you know, we got to be really careful. I agree with that. Um, I do want a clarification, um, John. Are you still there? I don't see you. But anyway, oh, maybe Leah, you can tell me. We can make it, we can always, the, the, what, gov what the governor has levied on us, um, we can make it more stringent, but we can't make it less. Is that correct? That is that's correct. correct. Yes. Right. So um, uh, where she still has the closings of the of the rental and all that, we can't change that at this moment. That's right, um, Kathy. Uh, it, she's very clear in her order that while, like as you said, there's that um, preemption language that while we can do things that are more stringent, um, certainly cannot be less. Right. So she didn't actually, did, and she it's. We closed the beaches. We voted for that. And um, Higgins Beach is open, though. So was that, did she claim all the, because I can't, I don't know if she really. She, she, she did not close the beaches. She okay. closed the state parks and, and some, some of the other. Some of those other, state beaches, but. Yeah, the yeah. State okay. State, but. Um, but we can coordinate as well then for that. Oh, absolutely. Right. So we don't have to just depend on the governor, Wecker, and with all the others for the beaches. Uh, as, as the chairman said, there are uh, weekly meetings with the town city managers right. uh, that are now including from Hampton uh, to Portsmouth up to Bar Harbor even. Uh, right. we, we are talking about this, this same issue. Right. So that's good to know. How, how close are you, John? Because we, we, you know, an awful lot of so would, like would like to, see to be it. able to, you yeah. know, be, be able to sit in the parking lots or, or take a walk on the beach and the coordination between the communities, I think is critical. So, well, I think a conversation. Yes, um, we have a meeting tomorrow, but my, my sense uh, is that we're waiting on the governor to see if she's going to extend her orders or not. Um, Any communication from her office at all? At all. No. Nope. But we can still work a coordinating out of the beaches at least. We, we can, uh, but if she, if she keeps the stay at home and um, the lodging, uh, we are the ones that extended the lodging to the 15th. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah right. I yeah. agree. Um, right. But we could also back it up if she cut it off. Right. Okay. But, but, but we have the rest of this week and a little portion of next week before I think she has to do, do something. I, I, I am sorry, but you know, um, I, I just think you're going to continue the talk and, and, and work with them. And, and I'm not necessarily that geared to her. Well, I think I'd be interested, John, and keep uh, me informed. I can pass it through to the yeah. board in regards to what all the town managers are saying. Whether it's uh, one day a week, seven days a week, something in between, not yeah. whatever it is. I, I think it's great that you're coordinating that and having those discussions. So obviously for the folks at home, nothing can change at this point in time until we get that coordination effort and conversation with the other communities so that we don't end community gets overrun. Right. Because I think we all, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has noticed how many people are walking on the roads. That's where they're walking now. In nice days to get the exercise, to, you know, to, for the So I think um, the, you know, if we can get something placed else where they're not on the highway somewhere would be beneficial. And safer. Yeah, I, 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 I agree um, that we could look at like like a Monday or Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing, or a Monday yeah. where we we just allow walking. Nobody in, I don't know how you put it. I, I watched the Jacksonville, um, you know, it got a little, for a little while, and then the pictures got weird on us. But um, the, the idea behind walking on the beach, and that's all you're doing is going for a walk on the beach. I, I could 
I could see us in the in the near future doing that. Uh, that if that's what opening means. Right. Uh, I, I want to tell people that I know I get a lot of emails and calls. None of us on this board control things like beauty salons and golf and things like that. And w whether that's going to be a governor decision, not a town of Wells decision or a Wells selectman decision. So um, I just want people to know that we, w the only thing really we have is, is the right. This second would be a beach and, and, you know, I, I hope in coordination with everybody would do that. Cause just like, the, the New Hampshire governor said it'd be better to coordinate it and right. not, not, not set one beach up for complete failure and a complete, you know, blow up of a, of a virus if, if everybody came, you know what I mean? So I, I think that the coordination going on between the states and John, what you're doing with other town managers is going to help us big time make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. We thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I would not be comfortable with making any decision regarding beaches without coordination with all the surrounding uh, communities. That way we're all in this together and we all have a, a common response. That way we're sending a clear message to all of our visitors in the state of Maine and, and actually the New England seacoast. So. Yep. And it's a terrific idea. And I think it's nice to, to, you know, to start doing something to help people. The other <clears throat> agreement on that, uh, the other thing I think we should share is for the most part, <clears throat> excuse me, our, our business owners, majority of those that I spoke to and what we were seeing here, I think it's prudent that um, we start to turn the spigot, so to speak, to turn the businesses back on. The concern that I've heard that I wanted to share with the folks from not the area Business owners are concerned that if we turn the businesses and open up the town too quickly, that we don't want to have a spike in the middle of August have to shut things down, which I think would be near impossible to do anyway. I do too. I agree. I think so, every restaurant owner I've talked to, and I'm not telling you I've talked to the majority, so that, that I don't want to be fair here. Um, the, the whole idea is keep me closed a little bit longer if you can get me open for good. Um, that's restaurants. I haven't, that's not lodging. I'm just talking restaurants. Please bear with me. Um, that to open and close would kill them because of, of supply. You know, they would have ordered supplies. They would have hired everyone. And now you're talking layoffs and all that stuff again. And, and just across my screen, it popped up. There'll be no green cards issue. So they're, they're, they're not going to find employees. They're going to have to get local. Uh, it just, President Trump just announced that no green cards for at least the minimum of 60 days. So I would think that's going to hurt our seasonal employees that come in from other countries, which is hard, hard to do right now anyway. I'm not, you know what I mean? But um, right. so, you know, I, I just, I want to make sure people understand that, that a, a lot of the restaurants say, please don't do that to me. Don't <laughs> tell me when you want me to open. Don't, don't make different decisions. So I, that, that's what I was told. Yeah. I heard, and, I heard and that's what a lot of them have said, you know, that, you know, and they don't want to, because seriously, I, you know, I'm going to just say it. If we pull the cap off this and everything starts opening up, it's going to be impossible to put that cap back on. One suggestion that I had heard if we were going to do a phase rollout was have like a 50% capacity um, ordinance or whatever you want to call it, something similar to that. A restaurant owner in town had suggested that. They said anything less would not be worth opening, but that particular individual stated that they could work with that. So I just wanted yeah. to put that there too. Well, so at the, same, at the same time, I, I've spoken to some and they said, if right. you open, then we need to open because right. those restaurants that are smaller, half of their seating might only be eight seats and it, they can't afford to open up and have all the overhead and expenses. Right. So, you know, and the concern here folks is, Servers and the workers who are cleaning rooms and serving at restaurants, their safety is of a priority as well. That we all right. take into consideration. Right, and I think I, I got to you got to respect the businesses. I mean, because they, they you know, they they want to keep their employees safe and they want to keep their clientele safe, and they'll do everything. I think everything they can. And some of their concern is that even if they were to open the doors tomorrow, they wouldn't have full capacity because people no. still hesitate to go. The the idea too, two, two ideas, one in talking to one of the hotel owners, he was legitimately scared how he could send a chambermaid into a room 
to clean right when the people leave. Like, so his plan was like 48 to 72 hours, that room sits vacant. I'm like, holy, you know, if you start adding the, the days up and who's filling that room, you know, I mean, normally, you know, having worked in the hotels for a while, you know, it's back to back, back, back. You just go with that room's occupied. Right. He's looking at not letting people in his room, you know, the chambermaid even in, his, in the room for, you know, somewhere in that 48 to 72 hour range, which would then limit the number of times he could rent that room, obviously, as you can see. The other thing with, with John, with your thing, the, the one restaurant guy told me his problem is the kitchen is his cost. The, the, the waitresses and the bartenders don't cost him anything. I mean, they cost him stuff. I'm not, but his major cost is in the kitchen, the salary he pays all those guys. And he really, even if he limits his tables to 50%, he still has to pay a chef a lot of money. He still has to pay these people to come in and get the job done, but he's only getting 50% of the profit. So his, you know, I mean that, that he would have gotten before if he had a hundred percent. And he said that might be tough to run. He didn't say it was, it was not doable. He just said it was tough to run that way. That's, that's all. And that's why I'd rather be in my personal opinion, safer and make sure they can open for good. Well, yeah. And that's, that's why I was adamant about pushing for the 15th deadline is just because I thought that was about as far out as we could yes, get exactly. without, without, you know, they'd give us plenty of time to have these conversations. So that was one man, one business owner's opinion. I figure it's pertinent to the conversation moving forward. But, um, you know, looking into this issue and seeing where the numbers are at before we make these decisions and everything, I think is going to play a large part in what we can and can't do. So it's just kind of a waiting game right now in my mind, see what's going on. We also have to think of last year, a lot of businesses were having staffing issues. You saw for higher signs up all summer long. And now that you're adding the, the green card issue into the equation, which a lot of local workers in Southern Maine are, and you're adding the fact that, that there are some serious unemployment benefits for some that are able to get it right now, that is, I mean, not everyone's getting it, because I've talked to a lot of people that said they've been waiting months to get on unemployment, but the people that are getting it, there's not a huge incentive to work right now, especially in a lot of these uh, businesses that we're talking about that are paying minimum or near minimum wage jobs. So I think there's going to be some serious staffing issues this summer regardless. I think, I think staffing and, and, you know, you always worry about whether people are coming or not. You know, I mean, it's, there's going to be some fear, but, you know, you hope they do. And, and uh, one of the things I just want to address real quick, too, in this, guys, can we please, as a town, you know, I'm, I promised I would stay positive all night, but I just want to say this. Stop targeting people with out-of-state plates. I, when I see this stuff now, it's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. I have friends that work for CMP. I have friends that have rental cars. I have friends that, that live here and, you know, works elsewhere that have cars with, with plates that aren't Maine. It, it doesn't mean they've, they've come here to disease the town, vi spread a virus in our town. They're here to either work or they're doing things. Please stop with that. That, that. that does not help us at all. It doesn't help with the us versus them that I'm seeing. It doesn't. It, it, try to be, I mean, look, everyone on this board has different opinions. Every, everyone here, every, every one of us does. I don't hate anyone on this board because their opinion differs from mine. I don't. I, if people think that. I mean, I know there are friends of mine that don't, don't like me right now because of my opinion. I, I can't believe that. That to me, my opinion is allowed. I, I've always had opinions. I, I, you know, that's part right. of my life. Right. And, and don't, don't be mad at us. We're going to make this. I make my decision based on what I read. Carl makes the decisions based on who you are. Every one of us here does like that, right? Don't be mad at us for that. And don't, don't be mad at each other for driving around with, with license plates. Try to, this is a tough time for everyone. It doesn't matter. Be kind to each other a little bit at least and, and try to help us get through this. No, yeah, there's just nothing helpful about that behavior. It, it really has to come to a screeching halt. I don't know who's doing it, but I mean, shame on you. You should not be out harassing people without knowing their situation. And a lot of these folks who have these out-of-state plates live here pretty much year round. I know a great number of them. You know, it, so there's really, they are locals. Stop targeting people. It's not, not helping us. And a reminder that people driving around taking pictures of people in, in parking lots for out-of-state plates, that's non-essential travel that you're doing. So you're breaking the law too, buddy. <laughs> John, do you want to update the We Are Wells Fund? I'm going to let Brittany do that. She set it up and it's a, it's a great uh, little program that still has some rollout to do, but it's active. Yeah, so um, this Monday we rolled out the We Are Wells campaign, which we talked about a little bit in the last meeting. 
Um, and the, the purpose of this is to raise funds for Wells residents who are most impacted by COVID-19. So we launched the microsite um, on Monday. And so far we've raised almost $4,700. Um, if anyone's interested in donating, they can see the link um, on our official Town of Wells page, which is Town of Wells, Maine. Um, it's pinned to the top of the page and um, the instructions are pretty easy. You can donate via credit card. Um, and if you are interested in doing a paper check donation, you can also do that as well and make it out to the town, just noting that it's for the We Are Wells campaign. Very good. That's awesome, that's great news. Uh, John? How would people who are in desperate need uh, apply? Are we doing that through GA or? They, they would um, either email um, Lori Lord, our general assistance uh, administrator. Uh, there, there are three levels of uh, uh, care that we will look at, uh, GA, uh, the alternate uh, fuel fund and the, this new special um, program that we just started. We reached out to St. Mary's. The food pantry is receiving a great deal of support, uh, but their other uh, program, I'm going to mispronounce it, called the Teething uh, Program, which is a alternate fuel program also. Uh, they have no money. They depend on the um, pledges uh, during church services and they have asked uh, if we would consider a donation to that. And I said that uh, we would consider uh, probably our first installment of $2,500 uh, to them, if the board feels comfortable with that. Have we researched I don't know a lot about, you know, my, my always worry is that we research just that the money goes to who they say it goes anytime yeah. I deal with it. Well, this is, this is from the parish. I have a uh, stationary. Okay. Um, All right. Yep. It's directly to them, right? Yes. Come yes. Versa. And what do they do with it? They do what now with it? They're, um, they, they work with uh, residents um, of, of the uh, town of Wells and it is a gunkwit and they're reaching out to a gunkwit. Um, it is, their uh, alternate fuel program, it helps with uh, uh, fuel, oil, propane. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think you have to be a parishioner of St. Mary's to, to obtain it. No, no. Their, food, their, their pantry program is amazing. Yes. You know, it is. Okay. No, I think it's great. Do you need a motion for that? Sure. You would. I make a motion we um, donate $2,500 from our um, program that you were talking about, John. You. Just the, the only question I have before we vote is their need for food and fuel, John. So could that not come out of the new fund or is that going to, can that come out of the GA? Uh, right now the pantry is well um, stocked and they haven't asked for any assistance yet for that. Okay. But it, it, it certainly can come out of any of our uh, alternate fuel or um, the special account that we've set up. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you. Anything else to add on that, Brittany? Uh, no, that's it. A couple people are asking for the link. Um, so I'll send it into the Facebook groups. And then again, you can find the link to donate um, pinned to the top of the page of the Town of Wells Facebook page. You know, if you, if you go to that site, that's where you can see how the friendliest town and the kindest town in Maine, in my opinion, is. Because there's a lot of people in this town uh, willing to do that. And if they can't afford, they're at those food pantries. They're doing stuff around town that um, to try to help people get through this. So, you know, as much as... I was just saying, don't do something. We have a lot of great people in this town helping people out through this. And I know there's a lot of neighbors helping each other out. I've, I've seen that in my own neighborhood. So, so what, what we'd like to send the message out there that, uh, you know, when you come to the town, you're not coming to the general assistance that has all these regulations and so forth. You're coming 
to a town that can give you a Hannaford um, gift card or work with IGA or wherever you shop to help you with food and personal grooming items um, with you know very little questions asked of, of your needs. Great. Well, th that was a great start for good news. Do we, do we have more? Keep it coming because we need it. Uh, good news. Uh, there's a couple of letters uh, basically thanking the first responders. Um, and and basically uh, the work that WIMS has done and uh, somebody in hospice and the good work that was done to um, with dignity and in, in transporting that person um, and so that's that's about it anything else from the board members well I just actually yeah this is good news right <laughs> yeah you had the chance to be part of a a birthday parade for a young man the other day that the fire department was able to make it to and um, you know that was uh, that was a, a great thing to see the smile on his face and uh, yes I was really happy that I uh, I was able to be a part of it I took my 10 wheel dump truck up and led the way for him so I, I you know what thanks John thanks for reminding me I, I do want to say I I didn't interact totally but my neighbor told me she wanted to say um, how professional our firemen were uh, she had a just a smoke alarm issue that scared her uh, they came up, um, you know, with their trucks, but uh, she felt they really handled it in a uh, professional way. And um, I, I watched it because it was right next door um, happen. And I, I just, I do want to say that um, thank you to Feynman. Um, you know, it looked like it was a minor thing, but not for her, it wasn't. So that, thank you very much. Well, moreover, I, um, I really want to thank all of our public employees. Everybody has done a phenomenal job through this. The police department with the, the videos that they've been posting with, um, I saw one with um, uh, Shabbat the other day reading. Um, you know, I'm glad we were able to get people to work at the transfer station because that almost turned into a mess for us. So, you know, that is an essential service. The highway department, those guys, I mean, all the windstorms that we've had recently with all the blowdown. So everybody's been performing top notch. So I think, I think a big thank you is in order for, for every one of our employees. Great, anything else? We're gonna move on to open to the public. I'm sure we'll have one or two questions. Uh, bring to you up. Hi, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Before you start, uh, I'm just yep. gonna mention that uh, we have had the, li uh, the lights flicker at the, the police station. I know we're hosting this through that. So if we go down, just give us a few minutes in uh, case the generator doesn't kick right on, that uh, we'll be back up and running. It just may take a couple minutes. So our faces will be frozen. Okay. Oh, okay. Because it was very muffled, Joanne, what you said. Okay. Brittany, go ahead. Um, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. We do get a lot of um, a lot of questions on on the COVID nineteen updates. Some of them are duplicative. Um, would you like me to just go down and read them as they come in, or would you like me to um, only read you know one specific question once? Well, if you if it's easy enough to read them out, so that if we have six of the same question that uh, are identical, more or less, then you can read it once. And if people have a follow up question, we can do it a second time. But it depends on how many questions you have coming in. I can't see the list where I'm sitting. So okay, it's quite a few. So I'll just go down the line, um, and if we've already answered something pending, it's a quick answer. Yep. Can, can go without it. So the first question is, could you please reiterate essential versus non-essential travel? The uh, essential versus non-essential is defined by the governor's order. Um, the governor's order, um, I don't know, Leah, if you have that there or? I do. Um, so I'm looking at the governor's order uh, number 28. This is the one issued on March 31st, and this is essentially the one that um, 
promulgated the stay at home order defines essential activities. Um, bottom line is if we're talking about what travel can be done, um, it's basically in order to conduct or participate in an act, essential activity, which I will summarize. It's a long definition, but I'll give you the highlight reel. And also workers in essential businesses and operations. Um, and she defined that in an earlier, uh, in an earlier order. But as far as essential activities, because I think that's what the question is directed to, basically it's only for the purposes of obtaining necessary supplies or services for oneself, family or household, members, pets, livestock. And this is um, with respect to such things as groceries, supplies for household consumption, supplies and equipments um, to work from home, laundry, and products needed for safety, sanitation, and maintenance of a home. Um, also, essential activities include engaging in activities for the um, essential health, health and safety of oneself, loved ones, excuse me, uh, family, household members, pets and livestock, including medical and behavioral health services, including obtaining medication and supp medical supplies. Another essential activity is caring for family member, friend, pet, or livestock, um, again, for essential health and safety activities, traveling to and from an educational institution for the purposes of receiving meals or instructional materials for distance learning. Um, there's the one about engaging in outdoor activities, but again, she emphasizes that it has to be in um, consistent with the gathering restrictions, the social distancing rules uh, put out by the uh, main CDC. Also any travel that's required by law enforcement or court order or travel to and from a state, local or federal government building. Um, so those are the only essential, um, sorry, those are the essential uh, activities that people can be traveling for. Lee, a quick question while we're on that subject. Um, I see a debate going on in the comments about what the punishment is um, for sure. um, for these orders because there's a debate of whether it's a class E crime or not. Well, I'm going to skip right to the enforcement provision of the same order that I was reading from, and it does say that it is in fact a class E crime subject to six months up to six months in jail or a fine of a thousand dollars. And it does say that this section can be enforced by governmental officials who regulate license permits and any other authorization to operate a business or occupy, occupy a building. So I think the intention there is to say that it's not just, um, you know, state police or local law enforcement or, uh, excuse me, local law enforcement, but it's, it's expanded to such folks as um, looks like, you know, code enforcement officers and similar. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it does. All right, um, next question. Um, will May 15th um, be extended for seasonal campgrounds? I think there was a, there were a few questions about, you know, whether or not that date will be extended um, or, you know, what the process is, is for, for that. The, the bigger question is what is the governor going to do? I, I don't believe unless there is a uh, situation where the governor comes in and talks about extensions that the town's May 15th would be ex extended. Um, it's really now up to the governor to determine what's going to occur. And as I said earlier, she really only has about a week to make that determination because her her orders end April 30th on, on most of them. Next question. Can we let residents only on the beach and give anyone without a residential pass tickets? Not, not at this time, uh, not in the environment we're in right now under um, the non-essential travel and, and so forth. The beaches are closed sort of on that same note, with all the parking closed to the beaches, why are they closed to people who can walk to the beach? Well, it's, it's uh, outside activity and they shouldn't be on the beach walking. 
Next if, question. If oh, I'll get, wait, I just want to clarify that because somebody asked me that too. If their house is along the beach? Yes, they can do that. But okay. uh, like Moody Beach, they actually own right in front of their house. Um, right. The public ways, whether it's the casino steps at Casino Square or the 19 right of ways, those are entrances to the beach that are closed. And we recently put Jersey barriers in front of them because the, the uh, police tape uh, had been torn off on most of them. Next question, um, when we open seasonal parks, will the season be extended? Are we talking uh, 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 RV friends? parks and campgrounds and uh, the selectmen are working towards a mechanism to extend the uh, uh, time frame of the parks uh, and seasonal cottages and um, by a few weeks into the fall and, and uh, early winter. And then also have the parks and seasonal cottages open up earlier um, in 2021. Okay. Um, we talked about this a little bit um, in the last meeting, but there is a question here on whether or not you can sit in your parked car and look at the ocean. We, we have been, um, the town has left one park open, that's the Harbor Park. Um, and that is a large enough area for people to be able to park and get out of their cars and walk around. It has trails, it has uh, a waterfront, uh, but it, it's a recreational area. The parking lots are not recreational areas. They are, um, it is non-essential that people drive through parking lots. Okay. Um, there are quite a few questions about enforcement. Um, one particularly says, are you going to enforce campers starting overnight in lots? And then on that same note, can the town please make a post um, discussing the enfor enforcement of these rules? The town has been enforcing where possible, where we known, uh, have known um, a violation has occurred, but, but as the chief had uh, mentioned and others, you know, when you see people in these places, it's not always what you think. Um, and we go and check it out and probably uh, three out of uh, the 10 that we've checked were violators and we've uh, moved them on. Uh, others have had either essential uh, jobs or reasons for being there that were legitimate. Um, next question. Um, someone wanted to confirm whether or not they heard correctly that taxes are not due until June 26. Interest will not accrue until June 26. Uh, as soon as we vote that, right? We have to vote. Yeah, as soon as we vote that. We're not there yet. Yeah, it's during this meeting though, right? right? Just hold on guys. Next question, why are we considered lodging if we own pay property property tax and do not rent rent? The facility that you're in is, is, is determined to be a lodging facility because they applied for zoning benefits that gave them greater uh, uh, numbers of units in your facility that gave them uh, the distinction of being a lodging facility. And if I might, Mr. Chairman and John, can I just add, add to that? That's, ab that's absolutely correct um, from the town's order, but also um, let's not forget that the governor issued on May, excuse me, April 3rd, her executive order number 34, which defines lodging operations very broadly to include 
um, you know, hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, short-term rentals, um, but also specifically parks for recreational vehicles and campgrounds and all public and private camping facilities. Um, so it's not just the town's order, but also the governor's order um, imposing restrictions on what she defines as lodging, all lodging operations and accommodations. Um, next question. Are we waiting for lodging to open before residents can access the beach? No, we, as we said earlier, we are working towards a coordinated effort to um, open the beach with the other communities from all the way down to Hampton and up to um, Old Orchard Beach, which beach is open. But clearly we, we want to not impact any one town uh, with this decision. Okay. Um, there were quite a few questions on whether or not we're collaborating with the neighboring states. Um, specifically, can we speak to what extent we're collaborating with New Hampshire and with New Hampshire seriously considering closure of all of their beaches? What impact um, do we feel this will have in local towns in Southern Maine? The town city managers, uh, for example, will have a, a conference call, a Zoom meeting tomorrow uh, that will include the city manager of Portsmouth, uh, Hampton, New Hampshire, and Rye, New Hampshire. Um, we will be coordinating a discussion of our two states and where uh, they see their governor uh, going uh, with this, uh, as well as ourselves. Um, down in New Hampshire is the governor who closed the beaches. Uh, up here, it's the local communities that have closed the beaches. Okay, next question. Are campground owners eligible for any of the CARE funds? Uh, I would seriously have them talk to uh, Senator Collins's office or King's office uh, who have been most helpful to our businesses right now in our town, or they can go directly to the SBA and ask that question. Next question, what is the purpose of registering the short-term rental properties? To know where they are. Um, in this uh, crisis that we're in now, uh, we have a lodging order in place, not only by the governor, but by ourselves. Um, we want to better understand who is a short-term rental in, in our community. And they should be probably, to be fair to the other lodging facilities in our community, be registered and be required to do uh, a couple of different things like life safety uh, ordinances, uh, fire, fire alarms, um, just because they are so pre prevalent in our community, 566, that this one program has identified April 1. And I'm sure if you did the survey July 1st, that might be doubled by that point. Um, it is a way to understand um, where these folks are and uh, have acknowledgement to the other lodging facilities that are paying taxes, paying um, um, their fair share, that these short-term um, units may not be doing that in our community. Can I just add to that something from my perspective? We had actually talked about having some sort of regulations in place as a board earlier in an earlier meeting, much earlier, and I think we all pretty much came out and said, hey, we don't see a need for it this time. But something that I saw that absolutely appalled and disgusted me was that people actually were advertising their Airbnbs online as come up in Safe Haven in Wells, Maine, or come up in quarantine, you know. We had now, and these, in one particular instance, it seems that there was association involvement in this. So you are thumbing your nose at an order that's meant to protect the health of the general public. That is a problem. And it was done blatantly. And for me, 
that's why I'm going to be supporting pushing for these regulations to identify these places because we cannot and will not have that. If we're trying to guide the town through a situation, you know, a dire situation such as this, we can't have, you know, kind of a lawless area, but then we're shutting down our hotels, we're shutting down our bed and breakfast, we're telling, you know, six months residents that they can't come in, but these other ones are gonna fly under the radar. Well, that's just not gonna fly with me. That's just my perspective. All right, um, next question. Um, if we own property and pay taxes, but don't live there, can we walk the beach? Uh, not while the beaches are closed, no. When the beaches are open, you're welcome. Um, next question. Um, we're owners of a year round condo we do not rent. Would we be able to come up to complete some work we are doing in our unit? No. Why can't we quarantine at our seasonal cottages where we own and pay prop property tax? Because you're not allowed to come up here in the first place from where you are coming from and it's non-essential travel for coming up here. Um, I can't tell you how many emails I get per day saying, I've just turned the water on and I want to come up and make sure I don't have any leaks. I'll bring some food up and just stay the night. Well, you can't do that because you have to quarantine for 14 days. Um, it's not, I don't think people understand what quarantine means. You better bring 14 days of food with you if you're going to do that. Um, a question on that note is, um, someone mentioned doing their quarantine time at home for the last month. Do they have to do it again when they arrive in Maine? If they come up yeah. at this point in time and violate our orders, yes because we don't know where they've been. Next question, would we ever consider extending the closure of lodging facilities until June 1st? I think you have I, to, personally, I think you have to wait and see. I, I don't think it's this, right now you don't want to do that. I think you wait and see. That's my person, that's one person. Too early, too early. I mean, I Early, understand. I'm not interested in doing that at this moment. I understand people need to plan, but on the same, I would like to think that we're going to get to a point maybe by the 15th where we can start looking at this stuff. That's why I want to hold. I don't want to keep pushing this off just because, you know, and that's, is that wishful thinking? Maybe, but you know, what else do we really have at this point with the current situation? And I would concur on that. We're still seeing, unfortunately, I believe we only had eight new cases in the state uh, yesterday to today. But if we are continuing to see a spike in, a, in an upward trend, decisions will have to be made, but not, not until we give time to look at what's going on before we decide to start opening. Right. Plus, we have to wait for the governor to see what she's going to do, which is first and foremost, that'll supersede whatever we want to do or can do. Um. Next question was about the old Olympia sports and what's going on there? Well, up until, and I, I don't know if it's still going on, but that was a Red Cross blood donation center. Um, we just touched on this, but um, someone's asking if we are waiting for the governor's meeting on the 29th before we make any additional decisions. All right. I don't know if she's meeting on the 29th, but uh, I think what people misunderstood, I said she has a very short window to either uh, tell the state what she is going to do with her orders to extend or drop them. Um, and it has to be before the 29th. Uh, next question, what tax relief is being offered to those losing rental income due to these restrictions? Um, 
the town is offering nothing. Um, I don't know if the federal uh, folks are or, or not. Um, will saltwater fishing be allowed for full-time residents? As of right now, they can, if, if they get a, get a um, they can fish down at the harbor. Um, and that's about the only uh, place that you can uh, physically get to. I think that uh, you can be on, on water and, and fish in, in wells. Next question, can a seasonal resort choose to open early in 2021 and 2022 instead of staying open longer? So I, I can I just address, so one of the conversations that happened um, with some of these seasonal homeowners, which I understood what they were saying, for a lot of them, staying open late really isn't an option because of what pipes freezing and stuff, which I didn't really think of when we made this offer. I, I don't see an issue with just saying if that's what they, want as we have this discussion we're still in the discussion phase people on this is saying for two years they can open up two weeks or like just give them april vacate basically school vacation week is when they can open you know i mean that that two weeks before may uh if if that's what the board decides not what i decide but um if if they because they're saying that when they close that's basically when they have to turn off the water and their pipes freeze but opening april that might not happen so yeah, I would be in favor of giving two years of opening early. But we'd still have to discuss that future. And yeah. And Mr. Chairman, um, can I just jump in also? Um, we haven't discussed the mechanism whereby to do that because certain procedures have to be followed. So I know I'm being very lawyerly, but that's that's the hat I wear. So. Um, I, I think it's important that we know and everybody out, out in the public knows that I, while obviously the board is certainly contemplating that, we still have to navigate through how to get that done. All right, are we good to move on to the next question? Um, there was a comment here, not necessarily a question, but um, the chief, you had mentioned last week that you would be willing to go check on people's properties if they were worried about something. And um, someone made a comment about that, wanting to just confirm if they should call the non-emergency line uh, for requests like that, and if that's something that you're still doing. Sure, we'll do it. Um, call the non-emergency line. Um, next question is asking, what's the difference between the beach and sidewalks? Be, would you clarify that again? Um, that's all the question says. What's the difference between the beach and sidewalks? I think it's in reference to the beaches being closed and what's what people can walk and what they can't. Well, certainly um, they can walk along any of the coastal roads um, that lead up to uh, the beach areas. They can um, walk through the parking lots and walk back. Uh, to where they came from. Um, you can go down, as I said, to the Harbor Park and enjoy the trails and the uh, waterfront uh, uh, overlook down there. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but that's it. Okay. Um, there were a few questions about the felony E. Um, and people are wondering if they have second year around, if they're second year round home, homeowners, can they really get arrested for going to their homes? So there were a couple questions about that um, ruling. Well, if they're uh, a second homeowner, a freestanding house down on Web Hannett or, or something like that, if we know that they're coming up here right now to uh, open up for the summer, then the police will go down and um, have, have a discussion with them as to why they're here um, and go from that point. If um, they are here and they're not, they haven't quarantined, then um, 
the discretion is up to the police department to move them on or, or give them a ticket. Um, next question is, can the list of over 500 short-term rental units mentioned by the town be published as it's now public information? The, the demonstration that they did only showed uh, blips on a map. They did not identify, you have, to, you have to buy the system or subscribe to the system before that answer um, is known. Certainly once, if we go forward with it and a list um, can be developed from it, it will be uh, made pub public because it will have a registration fee and that fee will come up every year as, as are the lodging establishments uh, published uh, and the campgrounds are published. So once we have uh, knowledge of who these folks are, uh, we, we can make that public. We don't have that knowledge at this time. Okay. Um, we just discussed this, but just again, there are a few people asking, um, would we be in favor of April 15th to November 15th for future seasonal cottages instead of May 1st to October 31st? The, the problem with adjusting it uh, for good is because in each of the site plans that establish these uh, facilities are the requirements that they open on a certain timetable. And you cannot uh, modify that without going back to the planning board. And I don't think, um, that will ever happen. What we are trying to do through our town attorney and through a review of our ordinances is to figure out a way that we can, on a temporary basis, grant this extension of time. All right, um, we're still getting a lot of questions on whether or not campgrounds, um, RV parks, lodging facilities, when they can open. Maybe we can just reiterate that um, one final time because questions are still trickling in um, about that. I'll take this, John. I think for, for me as one vote on this board, the one thing I've said in talking with a lot of people is the, the three words that unite the entire world right now is we don't know. We don't know much more than you do at home. We're looking at the data, we're trying to to make sure that the safety of all people, visitors and residents alike. And until we see some flattening of the curve or we see some, something uh, or get some leadership out of uh, the governor's office, we just don't know. And it's unfortunate and being a business person and, and a homeowner, I happen to be fortunate enough to have another home in another state. I can't go there uh, myself. So I understand, and it's difficult for, for everyone, but the universal theme here is we just don't know. So to, to give you any kind of an answer or speculation as to when things are going to happen, again, it starts with the governor, and then it comes to us. Until we see what the data is for the safety of all, at that time, we should be able to make somewhat of an informed decision. But until that happens, I certainly, as one vote on this board, am not ready to make any kind of recommendation timeline, nor I don't think our, our town attorney would recommend even the thought of a, a speculative date. Um, all right, another question here. Will the town abide to any and all decisions that may relax restrictions for seasonal owners to take occupancy? You mean if the gov if the governor were to decide to open up on um, May first and yes to April so, uh, to May fifteenth, isn't that the question? Gonna, I, I think that's what what they're right. asking. Yes. Yeah, we had talked about um, that because I had asked the attorney to make sure that um, that we can make it less, but we can, we can make it stricter than the governor, but we couldn't make it. Less. I think maybe that might have stemmed. Um, so if the governor, um, if the governor were to make it on 
May for instance, and all the other campgrounds and the right and every could open up. We would definitely have that discussion probably. Um, and we would make sure it was okay for the town of Wells. But right now it's May 15th for us and the governor hasn't made the decision. Right, and there's a clear distinction between the state of emergency order that the state put into place and the, uh, there was three of them, if I'm not mistaken, that were pivotal. There was the emergency right. order, then they closed the restaurants, then they closed the lodging and took the quarantine order and all that stuff, put that into place. So the state's guidelines say May 1st, we decided to go to May 15th because we decided as a board that May 1st was probably, you know, we might as well give people due notice and say the 15th. So even if she comes in and says, well, that's out, ours is still on. If the emergency order comes out for the state and we come out of a state of emergency, that's a different story. So those distinctions are important. Right, because if that happens, we lose ability to pass okay, emergency right. ordinances like we already have on the book. So all of our ordinances that we passed regarding COVID-19 within the last month and a half would all go away as far as. Yep. Well, that's, don't forget we, we initiated the, our orders through a proclamation before the governor. But that was that, but before we came on and actually voted for it that night, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought she did that just before we came on to that meeting. Yeah, we, we voted. We did it uh, March 17th. For what? For the for emergency proclamation. I thought she did it the 18th, but I, I might be wrong. Yeah. I we was thinking it was right close. But it was very either close. way, you have the authority to do what you want. We did. At this point. Yeah. 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 Yes, but and I thought I, one of the ordinances that we had hinged on the state being in a state of emergency. So. Yeah, I was under the same impression. Yeah. I, no. no, she gave the. Leah's going to answer, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Leah. I'm happy to. I mean, I, under your chapter 14, which is the emergency management ordinance, um, it does give the town, you know, be, because I think that let's let's think about context. The emergency management ordinances were enacted by the town, not necessarily thinking about a pandemic. That's one of the things that could cause a state of emergency to be declared. But the chapter 14 does give the town um, and the town manager broad authority to declare these things, which is separate and that authority is separate and distinct from the orders and the declaration of, of emergency by the governor. All right, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the lodging order specifically stated at the time of expiration or a termination of the state of emergency. It was the yes. language that we had put into place. Yes, but I think, and I could be wrong on this, this is hyper-technical, but if memory serves, I think when you did the extension of the order, you didn't say, remember you enlarged it until May 15th? And then I think that comma with the or until such time as the governor that dropped off. So I think it is a hard um, May 15th deadline there. Uh, Not I mean, to I think say that you can't revisit it and, and peel it back next week, say, if you believe that you, you want to do so. Yeah, we, but, can, we can actually, if we want, if we wanted to, we, and it was, and it was no longer um, determined by the governor, um, we could make the choice of shortening what we said was the May 15th date. Yes, you can repeal your own orders. Yeah. So but long as it's less, it's not, you can repeal it as long as it's not conflicting with or less strict than what the governor currently has in place. Right. Yeah. Right. Right, like we couldn't tell restaurants that they can open, you know, whatever tomorrow because it's still a state. state yeah. That's right. Um, Mr. Chairman, we, we have a second open to the public. Uh, yeah, let's move. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we could finish our business and do this. All right, Brittany, you want to uh, correlate the, the next round of questionings and we'll get to yep. it? Yep, sounds good. I, right, we'll, can I make a request on that, though? I, I tried to say this before. I think if the question is, are we open? When do we open? The answer is May 15th right now. That's all we can give you right now. So right. let's not ask that question anymore. And are the campgrounds going to open? Yeah, on May 15th, if we can. That, that, so I don't think we need to have any more of those questions personally, or if you can come mow you along. Uh, th those are things I'd, I'd like to not answer, but. Okay, fine. Moving on to current agenda items. The first being review and action on accounts payroll and payroll 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have two warrants this evening. The first one is Treasurer's Warrant dated April 21st, 2020. Uh, the warrant is $613,364.62. There's a school payment of $1,683,284. Two pay periods since we last met. First one dated April 9th, 2020. $81,644.59. The second net payroll is dated April 16, 2020, $76,407.46. Withholding for those two periods, $63,940 for a total expense of $2,518,640.62. Questions on the warrant? Uh, okay, I move to approve and sign the warrant dated April 21st, 2020 in the amount of $2,518,640.67. Second. All in favor? Aye. Abstain. Can I just ask a question, John? Um, because no. it's closed, um, do we get any discounts for what we have to pay the school? <laughs> Well, that's what they're asking us. I can know, right? Okay. Moving right along, that was a 4 0 1 vote with uh, Selectman McLeod abstaining. The uh, second warrant tonight is a special fuel fund warrant um, $153.41. I move to approve and sign the warrant dated April 21st, 2020, in the amount of $153.41. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Next is update discussion and action on committees, projects, issues, purchases, and personnel. Discussion and action to issue an emergency order to reschedule the June 9th, 2020, July 14th, 2020, to amend the town meeting document to reflect that date and to approve an order to postpone the date applied to late payments of second property tax installments due April 11th from May. 20 to June 26, 2020. I don't think that needs much explanation other than the way it was read. Kenneth, I'll take a motion. I have I a move? question real quick. Okay, okay, go ahead. So this is the one where we're talking about moving the election date, correct? Is that I'm sorry, Sean, you cut out. What, what was that? So the town meeting date would be moved if we approve this, yes. correct? Yes. So yes. what happens, my one question is a legal one for Leah, what happens uh, to the one selectman that is appointed for that term uh, during the interim between the elections? Do we get to not listen to that person for a full month? Or <laughs> do they get to retain their seat? I, I, Have you I, ever I, listened? I better be quiet on that one. No, there's a holdover essentially that until the next um, person is elected to that position or they're, you know, re-elected that they continue in that <laughs> Nice try, though, Sean. Yeah, that was very good. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay. We're ready. I move to approve the emergency order to reschedule the June 9th, 2020 town meeting to July 14th, 2020, and to amend the town meeting document to reflect that date, and to approve the order to postpone the date and interest will be applied to late payments of property tax installment due April 11th from May 26, 2020 to June 26, 2020. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero again, thank you. Next is discussion and action on the request by Walden Solar, Maine for the first amendment to the memorandum of solar lease agreement and the assumption of the solar lease for the 9B landfill site Solar LLC. John. So just a very quick uh, background. Um, we've been working with uh, a company, Walden Renewables, um, and through town meeting vote, we leased them uh, two parcels, uh, one over on the Crediford Road and the other of, of the 9B um, brownfield site. Um, and we're talking tonight on the brownfield site 
off 9B that uh, their lease that uh, we agreed to uh, had a um, an assignment um, a section of the lease that indicated they could, with our permission, assign their lease to a, a, a second party. And that is what we're doing tonight, is uh, allowing, if you vote that way, to assign to a LLC called Lil Littlefield LLC. And it's basically their way to shed some of the risk factors uh, because quite honestly, Jack Kenworthy is the principal of the Littlefield um, uh, LLC that the assignment is made to. Uh, Jack Kenworthy is one of the principals of Walden uh, Renewables. Uh, Leah? Yes, so I, I just wanted to reassure that this is very standard um, action taken and in fact, oftentimes these assignments occur even before the lease is entered into. And so just from a legal perspective, I wanted to reassure that this does not somehow um, impose greater liability than already existed under the leaf lease. Essentially, it's just transferring the rights that um, the assignor had to the assignee. And um, you know, it does not create any additional liability that didn't already exist. And frankly, um, very little liability exists because of the Main Tort Claims Act in this particular case. So um, whatever the town was on the hook for essentially under the original lease is basically going to be transferred to this new entity. But um, it really is just that an assignment from one entity to another and it's a very standard um, step that is taken in these kinds of contracts. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that all of uh, the fiduciary requirements of the original lease also pass along. So there's no changes in the financial package that we've negotiated. No, basically, if you think about it, it's just one party is stepping into the shoes of the other. And that's basically it. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? I move to authorize the town manager to sign the first amendment to memorandum of solo lease agreement and the assignment and assumption of solo lease from the B. Brownfield site. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Tim's muted again. <laughs> I do it to get disturbed, but yep, that's doing well. <laughs> Five zero. Thank you for that vote. Next item is discussion and action to approve quick claim deeds for the following properties that had a foreclosure date of February 27, 2020. The 60 day buyback period for the property ends April 27, 2020. First is Douglas and Harding. Property is known as parcel number 0140-006-00A. To pay fiscal year 18, 19, and 20 taxes on March 11th, 2020. Quick claim deed releases a lien filed in book and page 17787 728. The second is Gary Ward and Kristen Ward, parcel number 0027 slash 004 dash 001 dot 147. Payment was received to pay fiscal year 18, 19, and 20 on March 10th, 2020. Quick link deed releases a lien filed in book and page 17787 slash 853. Take a motion. I move that the board approve and sign the quick claim deeds to release the liens on the properties mentioned above. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you again. Next item is discussion and action that updates personnel committee assignments, resignations, and issues. There's none from the town or manager or the selectmen, so we're moving on to accepting donations and bequests. The first is a hundred dollar donation from Catherine Ryan and Susan Dalton to the town of Wells for the COVID 19 We Are Wells Fund. I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Next is a fifty dollar donation from Judith Gallerani to the Town of Wells for the COVID nineteen We Are Wells Fund. 
I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero again, thank you. Next is a $400 donation from the Patricia McDonald Trust, Wells, Maine, for the purchase of face mask materials for sewers to use to make protective masks. I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero, thank you. Next is $20,420, a grant from the Fidelity Chair and Forbes Family Foundation to the Town of Wells for the General Assistance Fund for Food and Fuel. I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. I'm going to second it with a comment just because these are the people I grew up with. I worked with Vanda for um, most of my life, early life, um, and he taught me just about everything I know, including how to speak up and not <laughs> and stuff like that because he was never afraid to do that as we all know. Um, no, he wasn't. His, his kids have carried on a tradition, uh, Karen and Joe and Matt, of, of making sure they give back. Now, this is an amazing donation to me. Um, and I just, I know they sometimes watch, probably not knowing them, but if, if they are, I, I've already texted uh, with them. I, it's just unreal that they were able to come up with $20,000 at this time to give to this fund. And I just want to say how much I appreciate That's a huge donation uh, at this time. So thanks to the Forbes. Um, I know Ben is proud of them. I know that. And Mary. And Mary. <laughs> it was my first, my first job ever uh, when I worked at, down at the takeout at the club restaurant. You were a takeout girl, huh? <laughs> yep. You have the window. And with that, I need a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you. And yes, very generous. $365, $365 donation from Tom Richard to the We Are Wells Fund. I move that we accept the generous donation and write a letter of thanks to the donor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you again. Next item discussion and action on approving the minutes of the April 14th, 2020 selections meeting. Any corrections or changes need to be addressed. I move for approval of the April 14th, 2020 Selectman's Meeting Minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 5-0, thank you. And Cindy, I know you're listening. Great job again. New business for the second time this evening. We are open to the public. Brittany, I'm sure you have some more questions for us. Yes, we do. Um, we have some questions about the COVID-19 updates and then some questions about the earlier conversation around um, beach parking. So I'll start with the COVID-19 questions. Um, why is a beach different than a sidewalk from a COVID-19 perspective? Well, the I would assume that means are... why aren't we allowing people to walk on the beach, but we're allowing them to walk on a sidewalk, I, which is, I think right. that is the point. I think uh, I, I want to speak to, I think originally the idea behind it was, and, and we have been in talks, we've already said we've been in talks to see how we can open it, but the original idea was when we this first started, we had an amazingly nice weekend where we were supposed to be kind of sheltering and doing things. And a lot of people came up. The beach was crowded. There was a lot of people around. People think the town was open and we weren't. So we said as this almost like a symbolic gesture, I guess you can call it, we need to close the beach. I, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's why we did it. It had nothing to do with whether the beach was nice for walking or it wasn't nice for walking. It had all to do with the fact that it's symbolic saying the town right now is closed and, and that was it. If, if I'm wrong on that, somebody else can speak up, but I just, that's what I felt. That was my recollection as well. Yep. yep. Busy weekend. Yes, it was. All right. Um, is an RV park with permanent park models in the same category as a campground that has transient trailers? Yes. Asking for clarification. Yes. Okay. Um, there was a question about the current state of emergency. How likely is it that we will come out of that? Well, we, don't, we don't have a crystal don't ball. I, I think you're going to know next week. Okay. Um, there was a question about the high density developments and, and who those were and what they are. Well, 
most lodging is high density, the RV parks, the campgrounds, um, the uh, three seasonal cottages, um, they were granted um, their density uh, because they're lodging. They fall under the lodging under our zoning. Right, because if you were gonna live on a spot, you, the density requirement for a year round building was a lot higher than what was for those. And the they got a bonus, they got a bonus so they could build more units. It would have been probably, correct me, Kathy, you might know of somebody else. It's yep. might have been a quarter of the buildings there, right? Probably 25% of the buildings that are there now would even be there. Well, different road requirements, too, if I'm not mistaken, right. when you actually start talking about doing a subdivision as opposed to a, a lodging facility, because that's what right. the alternative would have been, correct? Well, yeah, right. Well, originally, when they first, what happened was that there were motels. Okay, what really originally happened was there was a motel that got the permit to build a motel, right? So they could have like, they could have uh, 35 rooms on a, a place that you wouldn't even be able to have three houses. So this was because it was a rented facility. Rooms. All of a sudden out of the blue, no one knew, no one even at that time had even heard of such But they started selling the motel units, the rooms as a condo, a condo. And we didn't have any set up for that. We didn't have any um, ordinances to reflect that. And, and, and they were going like bang, that unit after unit was being sold. And all of a sudden, instead of having a hotel with 35 rooms, you had a hotel with 35 residential units sitting down, you know. And so there was an emergency call to action. And um, whoever was on the boards or whatever, that was, you know, that was when I was really younger. But um, but they, whoever was doing that, they decided to, um, to enforce and put the ordinance in that said, you know, because there wasn't any way around it. So what we had to do was kind of create an ordinance that said, if you had less density um, for a residential unit, then you could have, get a motel, a permit for a motel, but it couldn't, none of those units could be ever lived in year round as a residence. That's how it originally started. And then it just, you know, it just grew and grew and grew. And then it became the thing to do um, the, because people made a lot more money selling the units. And then they were treated as a hotel anyway, with individual owners renting them out. So that, that's how that went. Okay. Next question. How are excise tax and registrations being done now? At Town Hall, um, we are encouraging uh, people to do it online. Uh, rapid renewal uh, from our website is a state program that if you've registered your car here before, it's a very simple five minute exercise on the computer uh, and you get your uh, tags within two weeks and it's, um, it's the way to do it. Um, new registrations are not being done at this time. Uh, at, you have 30 days following the governor's uh, release of her declaration to get your car uh, registered or updated. Um, we at Town Hall are beginning to put in place some ways in which we can open Town Hall. Uh, it will not be business as usual. Uh, Town Hall is pretty uh, small in our different offices. So we are going to think through a staging area for letting people come in, um, maybe looking at how many uh, car registrations are due in May and June and what were due in April and, and March and think through a way to bring in the people as effectively as possible. Um, this question We've answered a few times, it's in a little bit of a different format. It's in regards to the barriers in the public ways. When will those be removed? When the beach is open. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to some questions about the earlier topic of parking and beach passes. Um, question here is, I know you mentioned future plans for the parking lots. 
Is there any plan to increase the size of the parking lots, more specifically the ones metered by the playground? That's very difficult because there isn't any land uh, to uh, extend there. Um, there is, uh, we, we abut up to the marsh and uh, to the east is a commercial uh, building and to the west is the river. We tried to do that at one time, got a huge fine. Huge yeah. We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you are, what, what if, what about if you are a renter and don't have a parcel number or property tax bill? I think this is in regards to a pass. Yeah, sticker. Yeah, I'll help you. Um, Brittany, it depends when they say they're a renter. If they are a year-round renter in the Channel Wells and they're paying an excise tax they would be, because they registered their vehicle, they'd be eligible for a beach sticker. If they are a renter for a week at a cottage, they are not eligible for a beach sticker because they're not paying any tax to the town of Wells. Thank you. Um, are there more stickers being sold than there are parking spots? Oh, absolutely. We have, like I said earlier, 500, a little less than 500 spaces and we sell 6,000. Now, why are we selling 6,000? Because we have probably 4,000 uh, timeshare weeks and uh, transient uh, issues. And it builds up into uh, that large amount of uh, beach stickers that are out there. Okay, um, here's a clarification on an earlier question about harbor parking and charter boats. Um, now that the charter boats have to pick up their people at the main pier, how is parking going to be enforced so that um, charter boats as commercial mooring holders have parking spots? They have had issues with this in the past. There, there is not a requirement that they pick up people on, on the Western shore. Um, there is a limited number of uh, parking identified for fishermen on the uh, southerly side of the, the Harbor Master Shack. Um, and those have uh, been there and we, we don't think we're going to identify any other spaces uh, for them um, until, until we get our new facility built on on the western side. Um, question here in regards to online transactions, what can um, community members do who don't have access to internet? They can go to the library. Um, there are eight or nine uh, public uh, computers right there. Um, if they, I think they uh, mean John. Just excuse me. The library is closed, but I think they mean yeah. it's to register their car or something. I think it's, you know, what I mean, I think they mean in this time, not later on. Okay, um, then they should wait um, until the emergency is lifted, and they can um, come back into town hall and and do it. Um, back to parking, um, there's a question on whether or not the amount of feet between vehicles should be greater than 20 feet. I can read the full comment. Um, it's a snippet from perhaps an order of ours. It shall be illegal to park any vehicle except a passenger car, motorcycle, pickup, truck without, um, protrusions or recreational vehicle measuring less than 20 feet in length at the Wells Beach parking lot. Should that be greater than 20 feet is the question. I, I saw that. That's right. Um, I did see that. You're saying should it read 20 feet or greater? Right. Should it be more than 20 feet? Well, I think we are saying it, if it's 20 feet, it can't, 
can't park there. And if it's bigger than 20 feet, obviously it can't park there. All right. Um, I think that's the majority of the questions. There is a note here um, just to give a shout out to um, our cashiers and people working in grocery stores right now just for all of the hard work that they're doing and you know, having an understanding that it might not be easy for them right now with tension so high and we just want to say thank you to them. Uh, so that was a good comment to bring up. It's a good one. Sorry. And uh, Mr. Chairman, we have our recording secretary coming on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been thinking about our, our farmers in town and their seasonal labor supply. And this year, it's just too dangerous to have farm workers going from state to state for the planting season and then having them come back at uh, late summer and fall for the harvest. And I wondered if anyone has uh, been in touch with our farmers to see how they're managing this year. And there are probably a lot of people right here in town, uh, people who are furloughed from their regular jobs, uh, students who have graduated and uh, waiting to start their job or waiting to go back to college in the fall. We probably have a good labor supply right here of people who could pitch in and help the farmers. Um, and when I was in the Army, I drove a Humvee and a deuce and a half. So I'm, I'm sure I could learn to drive a tractor. Um, I could help like, pick a couple of rows of peas or strawberries or something. Um, they, farmers would have things to sell at their farm stands. And I know they're, they're very generous about uh, supplying our, our food pantries. So it could be win-win all around. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Anything okay. else from the board? Just a, a couple questions. This one just came in. I know we just touched upon it, but I think it's important. Um, how, again, do those who don't know how to use computers or have access to internet, the question is specifically about how can they register their cars or pay their taxes? I know we just answered it, but this just came in, so I think it's important to reiterate. Well, they certainly can pay their taxes by writing a check and sending it in, in the mail to us. On, on vehicles, the, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles is closed. The, um, if you don't have computer, uh, a computer at home, you're going to have to wait until the town hall opens and the governor has given you 30 days following her re, uh, lifting of her emergency order to come in and register your cars. The police are restricted from giving tickets out for cars that are overdue for uh, registration. And that's as long as it expires during this uh, pandemic. Okay, and then one last question here. Um, back on the parking and the, the 20 feet conversation we were having, what about crew cab pickups? Crew cab pickups. I think the point, the point he was making was the crew cab pickup measures over 20 feet. So I think he was asking right. if that's so, included. You have a four door long bed pickup. It's not gonna be that much longer than 20 feet. My wife has a full size Suburban and I hauled it back on a 20 foot trailer, no issue. So you're talking a marginal difference. We're talking RVs, uh, things that you like a uh, that you travel inside and and self-contained, not a not a pickup. We're truck. talking about a slide-in truck bed camper one. Yeah, a, tr a truck camper. Yeah. All right. Um, I believe that is all of the questions. If anyone from the board or Officer Chris saw anything else, come in. Oh, we have one last question about beach stickers. If you own a mobile home in a park and pay taxes, can you get a beach sticker? We already answered that, but perhaps we can just reiterate for those who are just joining. If, if you've had uh, the mobile home as of, um, um, if you're getting a tax bill on, on that unit, yes. All right. I believe that is all of the questions. Good work, John. That was a marathon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Good job, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. John, do you have a town manager's report for this evening? Uh, no. Are you sure? We'd like, we'd like to extend this meeting of 10 more minutes. No, oh, that's okay. <laughs> all right. We get paid by the hour, you. right? Uh, <laughs> I make a motion we adjourn. I had one other thing. One other, Kathy, before you, I'm not going to second oh, that's it. That's right. It's that's right. I'll just leave it out there. Nobody seconded it yet. I got uh, good news, bad news for everyone. Uh, you know, the, the good news is Gronk's going to play again. Uh, I think you'll all be happy with that, right? Gronk's coming yeah. back. Uh, bad okay. news, not for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> bad news. Bad news. Aren't you trying to be up for re-election? You're antagonizing your... Everything I do is not, is not really pertaining to re-election. <laughs> well, who is, he, who is he playing for? Tampa Bay. He got traded to Tampa Bay today. So. With Brady. With Brady. Oh, what a shocker. It worse. <laughs> well, hopefully they make a lot of baskets this year. Yeah. <laughs> the old age club. Yeah. You guys are mean. I already made the motion. Sorry, I second. I second the motion. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're, we're talking about the Jets now. No, no we're not going to talk about the Jets now. So, with that, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Good night. Stay well. Thank you, everyone. Great meeting. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night.